The following content has been provided by RWTH Aachen University. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, DIS1 today. Um, we'll be taking a look at um, heuristics uh, today. You remember we had one of the uh, techniques um, that were called heuristic evaluation. Um, and that's what we're going to take a peek at today in more detail, um, especially giving you a, a nice compact set of rules that you can really apply pretty much any time uh, when you need to um, evaluate an interface design very, very broadly speaking. Um, and uh, those, those 10 golden rules, there's a variety of those out there, um, but um, you know, they all kind of cover the same uh, basic principles. And uh, this is what we're gonna go over today. And then uh, we may make our way into um, notations as well, depending on, on how we do with time. So very quick review. Uh, we took a detailed look at controlled experiments. So what's the key uh, goal of a controlled experiment? What are we trying to show in very, you know, general layman's terms? What's What's the idea? What are you trying to show with a controlled experiment? Hi, uh, so as far as I remember, you have a hypothesis mm -hmm. and you want to prove this hypothesis. Mm -hmm. uh, that's correct. You have a hypothesis that you want to prove um, and there were variables in there. Um, do you remember maybe what, what kind of con connection did we want to show between variables in, this, in, in the hypothesis? Um. When we redesign an interface that, for example, the time you take for uh, doing a certain action <coughs> goes down for some other variable. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, that's, that's a good example. Like we want to make maybe show that, that uh, the time it takes to select a target, for example, gets reduced in the, you know, the new way of, of interaction compared to the existing one. And that's actually a good example of the general goal. You have, a, you have some variables x, um, you know, that, that are your independent variables that you control, that you, that you manage, and then you want to show that changing them is responsible for changes of some dependent variables like execution time or error rates or things like that. Um, so we had a couple of effects that we looked at that can happen in these cases, especially when you are in a within groups design. So you're designing something uh, and everybody is doing both, you know, condition the condition one, for example, uh, you know, selecting with a mouse, and then they also do um, version two or condition two, uh, selecting on a touch screen, for example. Um, and there are some effects that we need to keep in mind that can occur when you do that. Anybody recall what kind of effects we need to be aware of when we do this kind of um, uh, study? Yeah, Victor. Good morning. Um... First of all, if I'm not mistaken, there is a learning effect. So if we try to conduct an experiment uh, twice within the same group, so mm -hmm. the second uh, experiment uh, could be not so useful uh, if the learning effect occurs before. That's right. And secondly, like if we split two groups into several uh, like into two parts, like one group do one thing, another group do another thing. So it basically means that um, the learning won't take place there. But here we kind of have problems that uh, our groups are not equal. So for instance, one group is better prepared for the tasks than another one. Right, that's the problem of the between groups effect. Um, you mentioned the learning effect. Uh, there was a related one related to the learning effect, kind of um, the opposite that could happen. Do you happen to remember what that was as well, Victor? Mm. Or maybe Sarah can jump in. Uh, yeah, the fatigue effect mm -hmm. was when um, in the within group, um, for example, when you do uh, two tasks um, after the other and uh, you can't focus anymore and you get... Um, yeah, sort of fatigue and you, um, yeah, are less productive, for example. Right. So that's a, that's a, that could explain why the second condition, you know, does worse systematically than the first, whereas the learning effect explains why the second one might do better than the, the first one systematically. And all of those, of course, are skewing your results that you're really trying to get. Uh, and so you want to avoid those. Um, 
we had a couple of tricks for, for minimizing those effects. Um, can we maybe go quickly over the different ways of how you get, get rid of them? We're, we're again, we're assuming a within groups design at this point. So people are doing multiple conditions at the same time. Um, and we want to get rid of those. Um, yeah, Jona. Uh, we can change the order of the, uh, of the tasks the participant, mm -hmm. participant have to do. Like example, um, we can randomize it. And there was something else. I think it was like Latin Square where you just uh, like change it uh, for each participant for one task and the order change for one task. I don't know how mm -hmm. to explain it. Yep. So that's, uh, there, there is randomizing, like randomly letting people go with one or the other condition first. Um, there is the Latin Square, which gets every condition before and every after condition at least once but it's not a full permutation. Uh, and then maybe in addition to that, of course, the, uh, you know, doing, doing the complete permutation of all possible combinations, which of course is very expensive in terms of, you know, um, number of users that you're, that you're needing. All right. Um, and we briefly looked at validity types. So you want your experimental results that you get to be valid. And uh, we took a look at two uh, fundamental types of validity. And these often come up when, when I review papers where people did experiments, for example, or when we design our own experiments, um, that, that kind of you need to take care of. Um, anybody recall those, those types of validity? And in a certain way, they're actually almost, um, well, not contradicting each other, but they, they, you ha often have to go for a, for a trade-off between the two. Um, Kaya. Yeah, I think two of them were objectivity and reproductivity. So uh, with the same data, you have to be able to get the same results. Mm -hmm. So so that's like being able to reproduce the results, replicability, or um, that that's one thing, definitely. Um, so that when you do an experiment, other people get enough information from your from your data so that they can replicate the results also, for example, in their, in their lab. Um, there were ad additional kinds of validity that we talked about briefly. And you recall some others? So there's the construct validity, which mm -hmm. is, I think it, if the experiment is constructed correctly, so are the variables uh, correct, mm -hmm. then there is external and internal validity. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what they were about. Okay, but those are the ones that I'm after because they are actually, uh, thank you, Jan, uh, they're actually the, the key ones. So external validity um, is trying to make sure, sorry, uh, that you are actually um, creating an experiment that to the outside is relevant. So when I do a study and um, I have a claim that I found found out a certain result, I want to make sure that um, other user groups also with other user groups, for example, or in other conditions, this is also true. So external validity is often limited in lab experiments with a particular user base or a very, you know, artificial task. Um, like I might have, I might say I have developed a sports watch that is perfectly operatable when you're jogging and all I do testing them is, you know, by having people maybe run in place, right? And, so then you could ask, okay, is that really externally valid when people do natural running, where they also move forward? Are the movements still the same? And will it actually apply to the, the area that I want it to be applied to? And the internal validity is really more about um, the correctness of your statistical experiment in itself, the, you know, picking the right statistical studies, making sure that, you know, you have, you have no obvious, um, for example, biasing effects in your, in your study or confounding effects that, that mess up your data. Um, if you like this stuff, there's way more where that came from in the current topics in HCI lecture that we have um, uh, in the summer semester. Um, like I think I mentioned that before, I'm going to be on a research sabbatical in the summer, but you will be able to take those classes nevertheless. Usually we wouldn't be offering any classes in the summer, uh, but um, since, since I'm not teaching, but uh, to make sure that you guys can, if you really want to take those classes for credit, we will offer a self-study option for these classes. 
um, where you can watch the videos um, and uh, you can get some assignments. We won't be grading assignments and such, but we will be writing an exam at the end of the semester um, for anybody who, who really wants to take those classes. This applies to DIS2 coming up in the summer and current topics in HCI, the research class in the summer. So they are available, although um, normally we wouldn't be teaching um, any classes in the summer. Um, but they'll require a little bit more self-organization uh, from you guys if you want to take those classes because you'll have to make sure that you make your way through the material at yourself. We won't be guiding you as we do with the IS-1 with weekly assignments and you know reviews and, and, and assessments, etc. Um, no midterm either, for example. Anyway, that was a quick interlude for you know a preview of coming attractions in the summer. So now we talked about the GOMS model, the, the keystroke level GOMS model. We talked about GOMS in general, and then we looked uh, in a little more detail at the keystroke level GOMS model. Um, can you give us a very rough idea of what is this KLM uh, model about, the keystroke level GOMS model? What, what does it do? Um, yes, um, I think the keystroke level model is um the execution time um, for a task, which you make uh, when you um, make a task, um, for example, when you perform um, a task with your keyboard. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it is um, about gesture time mm -hmm. also. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good. Uh, so yes, it can be the keyboard. It could also be the mouse, right? It's called keystroke level. But that's just saying it's, it's on the level of those very basic operators, right? Um, so, you know, pressing a key, you know, moving with the mouse, those kinds of things, maybe evaluating whether you picked the right menu item, those kinds of things are covered in there. Um, and it gives you a way to estimate how long it takes people to do a typical task sequence. The difference to GOMS is that with the KLM, you really are only estimating uh, one particular sequence, right? You don't have this pyramid of methods uh, and selection rules above the basic uh, operators that the GOMS, the full GOMS model uh, includes that models a more complicated task with statistical differences and how likely is it that people use this technique or this other technique, for example, to delete a word. Um, the KLM model is really more basic and just goes through a sequence of keystrokes or, or, or basic operations, uh, gestures as we call them, um, and uh, gives you an execution time estimate for that. And you don't need to build a prototype, right? You can estimate that without actually having to build a prototype and run an experiment with it. Uh, as long as you know what the prototype looks like, you can do this, um, this estimation, if you, as long as you know what kind of buttons need to be pressed in what order, for example. And of course, this ignores all the fine details of, of Fitz law, et cetera. It just gives you very rough averages for a key press, for a mouse click and, and those kinds of things. Um, and uh, does it make more sense to use a, a GOMS model, whether it's the KLM model or the full GOMS model, for a novice user or for an expert user? Uh, yes, I remember the museum example uh, that you mm -hmm. provided. So in that example, we found that it, uh, it's mostly useful for the expert users, not the um, uh, people that just... Uh, counter with it for once or twice. Exactly. So because novice users spend most of the time figuring out the interface, you know, scratching their head on what they're supposed to do. Um, that's not what the GOMS model mod uh, understands or, or models, right? Um, it really imagines or it assumes that you know the interface, you know what you're going to be doing, basically. You don't think about what the options are that you need to pick. You just do it. Uh, so it's an expert routine, expert user at a routine task. That's important too. To remember. And then we had a look at this interesting notion of information efficiency. That's where we got a little bit more mathematical uh, last time. Um, the information efficiency of a UI. Uh, this was a fraction of two, two figures um, and two numbers, if you want. And do you recall what, what the definition of that was? What were those numbers that we used to, to determine the information efficiency of a UI? Um. Yeah, I think it was uh, the minimal number of information that is required versus the number of information that the user um, gives to the system. Mm -hmm. exactly. exactly. So we can get that to be one, then we have a perfectly efficient interface because it requires no more information to be supplied than it actually needs to do the task. 
Um, and most interfaces, all interfaces essentially are usually below that ideal number uh, for other reasons, right? For usability reasons, for ease of use, for example. This is really just about how could I do the least possible, you know, moves to actually provide the information to the UI. Um, we also defined that for, for character efficiency, which is basically the same for, for key presses and, um, and keyboard based interfaces. Um, okay. So now with that, uh, we're going to move on to the 10 golden rules. And these are fun, uh, because like I said, they are things that you can always pull out. If you see an interface that's put before you, um, they always work to give you some basic principles to evaluate the interface by. Now, they are not constructive rules in the sense that you can just use these 10 golden rules and then from a blank sheet of paper start building a whole user interface. They are um, evaluative rules, I will call them. They are rules that you can apply to analyze, analytical rules to analyze an existing solution. Um, and uh, they, they won't be quite as good when you are really in, sitting you know, in front of that blank slate and you want to start from scratch. That's where other things like uh, for example, design patterns are more useful to create an interface from scratch because they really guide you through the design process step by step, breaking down the problem into a UI design. Whereas the 10 golden rules are things that you apply once you have a design and you want to see, did I miss anything? Does the interface you know, make any obvious mistakes usability wise? And the first rule is keep the interface simple. I'm not going to read all through all of these because we're going to cover them one after the other here. Um, First rule is keeping the interface simple. That's the most important rule. Um, and it's awesome. It's one that we need to pay close attention to because especially with a technical background, um, your first user interface design that you come up with, your first thought of how the interface could work is very often too complex or it is just a little awkward um, because you haven't quite thought through the, the, the task itself completely yet you haven't found the best way to handle this task with a user interface yet. Um, and it's very easy that features creep into your UI over, over the course of, you know, design iterations that you do or multiple versions of the same product. Um, especially when you have something that get, goes into version two and version three, um, the case is often that you will get, you know, feedback from your consumers or your users and there will be some people who say, oh, I would like this feature, but there will be very few, if any, people who will say, you know what, I never used this feature all year that you got in there. Take it out, remove it. Yeah, we don't work that way. We want to kind of like, you know, have everything available just in case. Um, and especially as engineers, we try to cover all our bases. Um, and the problem is that this leads to feature creep. So features creep into the UI slowly and make it more and more complex over multiple versions. Take a look at, you know, the first version of uh, Microsoft Word uh, and, you know, what Word looks like today. Take a look at the first version of Adobe Photoshop and look at what it looks like, what how it works today. These are wonderful examples of feature creep. They just get overloaded because the way you sell a new version, especially in software, is new features, right? Um, there, was a, there, there was a very memorable, um, keynote by Steve Jobs many years ago when he announced, I think this was like maybe 10 years ago, um, when he said, you know what, the next version of Mac OS is coming and it will have zero new features. And everybody was like, what? And then he said, no, we're not adding any new features. We have added a lot of stuff, you know, last year and we're going to spend the whole year for the new version here to make it more robust under the hood, to make sure that the things that we have are stable, uh, that they're more efficient, that they're faster, but we're not going to add any more complexity to the UI. Uh, but that's a rare call. And, and you kind of, you can pull that with an Apple crowd because they understand usability and the value of it. But for most, you know, consumer, uh, consumers, this is hard to, this is a hard sell. Um, on the other hand, the experience shows that most of the tools that you actually use follow the 80-20 rule. You only, you know, 80% of the users only need 20% of the features, right? Um, most of the, there are many, many things in, in for example, Word uh, to pick, you know, a standard uh, tool that everybody kind of has used. Um, most of the things in there, you've probably never touched and you, you probably never will because you just don't need them. Um, but they're there, you know, and... Uh, 
And of course, you're happy to find them if you if there's that one case where you need them. But we have to remember that any features that you add are really things that make the interface a little more complex. This is really hard to avoid, right? Because there are more options to pick from. So if you cannot, you know, follow that honorable goal saying, oh, I'm just going to make things easier and not, uh, you know, add more features, um, then you can move out feature sets to, to for example, sub dialogues or, you know, so, you know, configuration pages or things like that. Or what we sometimes see happening is that um, there is um, an existing version of a software and then they release a new version of it. You know, Photoshop Elements would be a good example. It was an attempt by Adobe years ago to cut down the, you know, the more and more complex Photoshop that was becoming completely intractable for beginners and just give most of the people who bought Photoshop just to do a little bit of photo retouching on their actual photos um, to give them a more basic tool again right? um, and removing many of the features that the advanced Photoshop had that they didn't need. So that's another way to do it, to introduce a new product line that kind of starts simpler again, that cleans up. Oftentimes that happens when people move to, for example, from a desktop app to an iPad app, for example, uh, that's a good uh, opportunity to clean up the UI because you just cannot have the same complex interface on a tablet or, or even a smartphone. Here's an example that I really liked. Um, this was, uh, picture was taken from, from um, uh, Mac OS Mavericks. Um, um, this, uh, I was, I was you know, tasked with, you know, I think many of you guys know this, um, you got to do the IT for your parents, right? You got to, you know, your mom and dad want to get on the internet and they need a computer and they need a browser and they need email. And so these days, you know, they've mostly get, gotten that settled and they may now have more advanced requests like, you know, get me on Zoom and stuff. But, you know, oftentimes it's like, just make internet work. And um, so I was challenged with that as well with my mom and um, so I set up a, a Mac for her and I found this option called a simple finder. And the simple finder basically removes 90% of the options from the finder, which is, you know, the, the, the Windows Explorer of the, the Apple world. So it's the, the fundamental interface that you use to create documents, to, to move documents around, to open them and so on. Um, and it did not support a lot of things. Like, for example, double clicking was gone, right? You could only single click with this interface. Uh, there was no dragging of files. Uh, there were no aliases, or, you know, um, con connections between um, uh, references and, and the actual file. There was only one window, like that you can see right here, that you could open. You couldn't open multiple windows. This window had a fixed size. It also had a fixed view of what it was showing you. Um, there were no toolbars in this window, as you can see. Um, folders did not exist. I mean, you could create folders, but if you wanted to, you had to create them from inside an application that wanted to, when you wanted, where you're storing a file, you could then create a folder. But, you know, the, fi the fi basic finder thing was just this flat thing where you could throw a couple documents and work with it. Um, you only had access to a specified set of applications. So um, the administrator, that's me, uh, could limit the access to specific apps um, so that, you know, all this, you know, the other apps wouldn't be confusing. And on those apps that you had access to were actually shown at the bottom. Uh, so you didn't have to go into like an application folder or anything. They were right uh, there available in a doc at the, at the bottom of the screen. Um, if you had more, more documents than what fit on this, you could, you know, go right and left with these little, you know, arrows here. Um, but that was it, right? Um, and this worked tremendously well. I mean, I had the, the ultimate test was, I hardly ever got any calls from my mom saying, you know, I, I'm having trouble with this computer. Uh, I can't find my files or anything like that. She just got along with it well. And she didn't need all the extra things because she wanted to occasionally, you know, write a letter with it or, or, or um, you know, print out a document that she found online and stuff like this. Um, the problem, of course, with some something like that is that you have to make sure that all the everybody plays along, right? And with with this, for example, I experienced when um, I installed um, Microsoft Word on this, the Office said it actually started creating a settings folder, which is something you never want to see, even as a normal user, really. But it put it right into that documents folder. So all of a sudden, there was a folder there that my mom hadn't created that she didn't know what it was about, um, and so they broke this uh, simple finder concept because. You know, the developers um, at Microsoft hadn't paid close attention to um, covering this use case of the simple finder in macOS. 
So, but from, fundamentally, this is a this is good design, right? Here's my um, universal logo for explaining. I'm showing you a good example here, right? Because I'm going to show you some bad examples too. So I just want no confusion about that. Um, another a wonderful example for feature creep also is is uh, the Blu-ray player, right? When you bought your first Blu-ray players, what did they do? You open up a slot, you put in a Blu-ray, uh, you close the slot, and the Blu-ray would play. Awesome could watch movies on this, right? This was before everybody was watching movies online only. Um, and then Blu-ray players, um, you know, were were useful, but then you, everybody had a Blu-ray player who, who wanted one, right? Who, who was looking for it. So then, you know, companies like Samsung were like, oh, how are we going to sell more Blu-ray players? Um, especially to the people who already have one. Well, let's add some features, right? And then you get things like, oh, you can, you know, also watch Netflix movies via your Blu-ray player, or you can, you know, go, online and browse the web using your Blu-ray player, which was usually a terrible experience because the interface you had was this little like, you know, remote with a couple buttons on it. Um, but, you know, it was a computer and a computer in the Blu-ray player is, is very flexible. It can do any kinds of things. And this is very tempting to put information on there or put to things on there that you don't really need. Um, so that's a bad example, right? This is an example of, of, blue, of, of feature creep. Let me give you another example. Um, Getting up in the morning, I, when I get, have to get up in the morning, I really only need a time that is accurate to 15 minutes, right? I either set my clock to seven or 7.15 or 7.30. Um, I don't need anything more precise than that. I don't need to get up at 7.08, right? I also found that all the alarm clocks you could buy, you know, online or at Media Mart and so on were terrible. They had rows of identical tiny little buttons that were used to set you know, the time up and down by a single minute. And that's the last thing I wanted to struggle with when I'm like super tired and I just want to basically, you know, half asleep, I want to set my alarm for the next day. Maybe you've been in a similar situation. It's really, you know, not fun to go and type on tiny little touch screens or tiny little buttons on your, on your, on your desk side, on your night desk to set the time when you really want to go to sleep. So I built myself my own alarm clock. And this alarm clock, um, had a couple interesting features. Um, the first thing was um, you could only set the alarm in increments of 15 minutes, right? That was it. So basically there's you, um, no way to set it to 708. It was just, you know, seven or 715, good enough for me. And it made it super easier um, if I wanted to change the alarm to get up later uh, on the weekend, I would just, you know, uh, set it to be 30 minutes later. I also got rid of these identical looking buttons based on the principle of natural uh, mappings that you guys already know. So instead I used a turning knob, as you can see down here, that had a nice little ratchety feel to it. So it would click, 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 click like that. And every turn clockwise would advance the, um, the time for the uh, wake up by 15 minutes. And every time that, you know, turning it counterclockwise would turn it 15 minutes earlier. So simple thing was, the if I it was in bed and it was Friday night and I said oh tomorrow I can uh, I don't want to get up at seven as it says here I want to get up at eight all I do is reach over there I don't even need, need to open my eyes for this I can feel this button I go click 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 I know I've set it by an hour later done right so this was really convenient when you're like half asleep um, and turning it off you know the alarm you just pushed on that little uh, knob there um, to to turn off the alarm. Um, and that was pretty much all you had to do. If you everyone needed to change the time, you really didn't because it had a had an, um, uh, a wireless module that would get the time from the internet. But if you ever needed to, there were buttons on the back where you could do that. Um, so what I'm trying to show with this, this is an example of a design that gets rid of a lot of stuff, right? Um, it removes a lot of the complexity that that and the feature creep that has happened into this kind of product area of, 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 of alarm clocks. Um, and reduce it to just those things that you really that you really need, and that makes it easier to use. Here's another example. This is I, sh I think I should really say this is, this is an old screen from an e-learning administration software called Evento by a Swiss company Crea Logics. Um, and as you can see, apparently the designer of this user interface. Um, I don't know. Maybe he had some ecstasy, and then he discovered you know the. Uh, the tab function in his GUI builder, right? And then he went crazy. There's like four rows of tabs up there, right? Which of course is completely impossible to use. 
And um, I'm imagining if you resize this window, they are probably going to wrap around and resort themselves based on the width of the window. So you can't even remember where they were. Um, so that's not a good design, right? And even beyond that, of course, you know, the interface is way too convoluted and complex. It's showing too many things at one time, um, really hard to parse. Um, you would lead a long time until you found yourself, um, you know, fairly re reasonably competent in the software. Um, and even then, you know, all these tabs up there, that's just not the right way to use tabs, right? This is not what tabs are meant for. You should use a different concept, like more menus and menu items, sorting these things into uh, stuff that belongs together. He also apparently had this basic illness that all computer scientists seem to suffer, that he only knows um, the primary colors, right? Yellow, red, and green were kind of all the colors that he was aware of for his little um, tokens up there, his little icons in, this, in, this, in these tabs. So not a great design. Um, we'll have more examples as we go on with this, but I want to make sure that you, you get this idea, right? This is the, the keeping the user interface simple doesn't mean that you that you make that you remove everything that's available, but it means that you make sure that you focus on the key things that people want to do, um, and you really design the interface to be is extremely good for that. Right? Uh, a question that I often ask when, for example, the other day I was asked to to help evaluate the new uh, uh, IP-based phone system that Arbitra is getting, and I went around and talked to my PhD students and I said, "Tell me two things." Which functions on your desk phone are you using every day, several times, several times per day is a good measurement for a really important function. And they gave us, gave me a few things, you know, um, like calling an internal number at Avatih, for example. Um, and then I said, okay, and there are there other functions that you need, you know, maybe a couple of times per week. And they're like, yeah, occasionally I need to like look up a new number in the address book or something like this. Um, or, you know, retrieve a voicemail that somebody left me. And so then we had a list of, you know, A functions and B functions. And those were really all the ones that you needed to optimize the UI for. Everything else can be a little more difficult to reach, can be hidden away um, behind an advanced setting screen or something like that, so that it gets out of the way for the everyday operation and the first time encounter and the quick pickup of a new UI. That's rule number one. Rule number two is speaking the user's language. What we mean by this, um, if you are a TK student, then I'm really preaching to the choir here, you know this. Um, it means that, you know, in, in the terms of, as it's called, communicative usability, um, which our TK students know a lot about, um, that you are, the interface is communicating to the user certain things, right? In the words, the concepts that are being picked, uh, how it visualizes things, uh, how it names things, um, and this needs to speak the user's language. So you need to take those concepts and words from the application domain of the user, not from the technological domain. Um, how do you know that? How do you know the right words and concepts? Well, you talk to users, right? You talk to them and you let them explain to you their typical um, work processes, their tasks that they do. And in describing those tasks, they will use the right words automatically, right? They will say, well, um, you know, when I get a new, when a new order comes in, um, I go over here to our, uh, I go to the warehouse um, and I, 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 you know, I combine, I, I make a packaging, I make a package out of the, uh, the items that the person ordered. And, and then I, I, I retrieve the user's address from our uh, address book here. Um, and then I send it off for shipment. There were lots of words and concepts in there that you can use in a software, right? Order shipment, address book, commissioning, a package, you know, pack, all these kinds of concepts. So use those names in your software, right, for that domain. Um, for example, if you go to an architect, they will be talking about their drawings all the time. Uh, so don't call their things files, you know, call the files that are drawings, drawings, right? Use those terms so the person finds themselves at home based on their application domain expertise. Um, and it's not just about words for things, it's also about words for processes, like, for example, the order that I just mentioned. Here's an example um, that has the wrong title, by the way, Oli. <laughs> I just realized, because uh, this is not at all about Zoom captions. <laughs> this is actually um, a, sorry, we had a different example in there that we removed, uh, but we didn't change the title. So this is an example of a screen uh, that we found 
uh, when we were doing a usability test for the magazine Connect. You might know the, the Connect magazine. It's, it's, it's kind of like a, you know, a, a mobile technology um, magazine for geeks. So it reviews you know, mobile tech. And uh, they asked us to review um, tablets about their usability. This was around the time when the iPad had come out and, so, and, and Android tablets were coming out. And they wanted to understand what the usability is for these things. Uh, and so we took a look at, uh, at a freshly installed Samsung tablet here, which is running Android. Um, and uh, we found things on there that even in the basic naming of items were very confusing. So for example, we were not sure, I don't know, I don't think, do we have the highlighting here? No, um, now it comes, okay. So there's all share play, uh, like what is that? Why is it called all share play? Or what is an S suggest, right? It's, it's unclear, there are things in there uh, that don't really mean anything to the user until they, they pick it up uh, and, and, and try it out and, and try, try to discover what it is. Or PS Touch, for example, right? That's also uh, a weird name for, for, an option, uh, for, a, for a program. So um, this is using bad names for, um, for items that, that should, be, should be very obvious, right? When you buy one of those tablets, our test scenario was, you know, uh, a pensioner buys a tablet and they want to read their newspaper, their local newspaper on that tablet, uh, and they want to write an email. That's all they want to do with it. And we, we looked at what's the user experience of that. So we did kind of a cognitive walkthrough experiment with these people, uh, with, the, with this user profile of all these different tablets. And, and a lot of them did really not well. Um, this is, of course, an effect that happens because Samsung is trying to push their own uh, marketing speak and their own branding onto uh, the Android UI, and it makes two interface concepts mingle and mesh uh, in an inconsistent way that basically makes the user suffer the consequences. Um, we, but we have similar examples. I mean, browsers are, are well known for using cryptic names that mean nothing to you unless you are, you know, already an, an internet kind of, you know, aficionado. Um, Safari is a bad name for a browser, but so is Chrome, of course. Um, I think uh, here the price goes to Microsoft for just naming it the Internet Explorer. That was probably the best name for, um, for a browser that, that actually meant something. Um, okay, so uh, another example. Uh, this is a remote, and, and I love this. This is a remote from a, uh, an AV receiver, like from, from a hi-fi uh, set that you might have at home. Um, this is from Marantz, which is actually a pretty expensive company. Right? So you might think that they get it right, but they don't. Um, Check out the labeling on these. It's it's amazing. I kind of I kind of get what tuner and TV does. That's okay. And VCR one, if I still know what a VCR is, I get it. But DSS, I was thinking maybe that's the button that takes you right to you know Deutschland sucht den Superstar or something like that. Uh, and then okay, CD DVD, I get again. But then there is AD. I don't know what that does. Um, and. And ATT is kind of like, you know, an attention um, grabbing thing or something like that. I don't know. It's very confusing. Uh, so there are lots of names used in the system uh, that don't mean anything. And it gets even better with the buttons below. Um, like we've got two rows of identical buttons um, that point up and down. So I have no idea what that does. Why are there two? Um, and then there are buttons down there. I'm not sure whether you can see that. Um, but they are actually labeled um, with one, uh, you know, crossed out speaker. For, speaker, I, I get that. That turns off the speaker. Um, and then there are buttons for S, M, and E, X. And I wasn't sure. Maybe that's for like, you know, if you go clothes shopping online, you can select your clothes size there or something. I don't know. Um, and then there are little options down here, like A slash C, H device, right? I don't know whether that switches to Austrian and, and Swiss channels or something. No idea. Um, so really bad labeling and naming of, of things that don't mean anything to you until you've really dug through all the technical documentation of that, of that receiver. Um, here's an example that uh, does it better. Um, when you take a look at um, iTunes, the, 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 the app that, that you use to, to, to manage your music, um, or these days it's called actually Apple Music, um, it actually, you know, the word file hardly ever comes up. Uh, it usually talks about music when it talks about, you know, the thing in general or a song if it's about an individual, you know, um, audio file or movies when it's a video file or playlists. 
it doesn't use the term file very often. Um, and this is true not just in, in, in the menus that you drop down, but also in the dialogues that pop up and in the online help that are, is available for the system. We've, got, we've popped up a, a few um, examples here of the, um, of the menu items here, and you can see the, how it works. There's only one exemption. Um, file, for example, does come up. For example, the menu is still called the file menu, and that's where it's um, trying to match the you know, cross-application consistency requirements that Apple has. Um, so to be consistent with other applications, there's always the file menu next to your application menu. Um, and so that's why it's still called a file menu. Um, and that already shows that oftentimes these goals, these different rules actually can conflict with each other. So you can actually run into trouble trying to really fulfill one goal um, when it kind of, you know, doesn't match um, an, another goal. But overall, this is a good way to do it, right? To use the terms from the application domain. All right, that's rule number two, um, speak the user's language. Let's look at one more. Uh, and I, I love this one because it, they, you know, systems get it wrong so many times and so hilarious to watch that. Um, make your interface consistent and predictable. And consistency, first of all, is needed at many levels, right? You need it, for example, if you have similar situations, the commands that you use should be similar, right? Whether I delete a folder or a file, um, it should be a similar kind of gesture that I execute on the folder or the file icon um, to delete them. They shouldn't be completely different. Um, but also, if you use terminology, like we saw in the Apple Music example, in your menu items, you should make sure that you use the same words in your in your dialogues that pop up, in your help pages, and in your written documentation if you have that in the PDFs that you that you send out along with your app. Consistency goes even further, though. It determine it depends on fonts, right? You want to make sure that you use consistent fonts in your interface um, across all the various different designs and. Uh, uh, you know, visual design, you've had, we've had a lecture on electron and visible design here in this class. And I did this in part to, to you know, give you a little bit of typographical and, and, and sort of page design basic knowledge so that you can apply the right consistent rules there to make sure that your visual appearance is also consistent and, and aesthetically pleasing. Um, layout, right? Um, you know, do you, do you always, are, are your dialog boxes always uh, left aligned or always center aligned, you know, those kinds of things. Upper lower case, right? Do you, do you actually pick the right um, spelling um, in your dialogues, in your menu items, how, what's, what's capitalized? There are whole guidelines about this in good user interface toolkits. You get guidelines by the system maker, like, you know, Windows or, 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 or um, Mac OS. You get guidelines how you should be capitalizing your items. There are clear rules. Um, and you might say, oh, that's just a detail, right? Who's going to pay attention? But you'd be surprised. A lot of people will say, mm, somehow this interface looks uh, like a, you know, a lay person put it together. I can't put my finger on it, but it seems not to have that polish. And oftentimes it's these kinds of things that people notice. They can't put their finger on it, but they, they notice nevertheless. There are, of course, some uh, exceptions. So, for example, um, you always, when somebody presses a um, presses a key in a text processing application, um, you want to echo that key back to them so that they see it on the screen, sure. Um, but if they are entering a password, you don't clear, you know, you don't echo back the, um, the, the password in clear text. So that's an exemption uh, that makes, makes perfect sense, right? Um, like if you have a command line interface, you always show the letters that the user is typing, but if they're entering a password, you don't. Um, or you may have, um, you know, extra security checks before people are erasing files, etc. Although we'll get back to security questions, they are not the, the best solution either. Uh, we'll see some examples of that in just a minute. Let me show you an example uh, of, of a good design and consistency from a system that you've already seen. Um, we watched the video on the Xerox Star. You might remember the guy you know, sitting there in his, in his you know, office chair explaining the Office Star system to you and talking you through the the whole desktop, right, from the history lectures. Um, and they had the exact same physical buttons that you used um, to copy things, uh, whether they were a file 
or whether it was a word in a text editor, or whether it was an object in a graphics program, etc. Um, and they had this for a whole bunch of things, like for move, copy, delete, um, those kind of things were, were like standard buttons that you just pressed whenever you wanted to cut, copy, move, or delete something. Um, and this is still true today um, with, you know, for example, cut, copy, and, and paste, although uh, we have moved away from having dedicated keys on our keyboards, uh, we now use um, keyboard shortcuts, right? You press um, Command X for cutting or Control X on Windows for cutting. And that is also true across many different uh, scenarios, whether you cut out a word in, in your text editor or whether you, um, you know, cut out a file in a, in a, in a folder in your, in your finder or, uh, or desktop. So that's a good example. Um, the last one I want to share before we take a quick break here is um, consistency also has a uh, tendency to be better when you actually apply vertical design. What do I mean by this? Um, there are some manufacturers that make their own hardware, make their own operating system, make their own key applications, and make their own graphical user interface. Uh, and when it all comes from one shop, one, uh, under one roof, essentially, then it is actually much easier to create a consistent experience. Um, uh, I call this vertical design, uh, where all of these things are coming out of you know the same uh, the same factory, if you like. Um, and Apple is an example of that uh, that does that. So, for example, uh, the um, you know it, it's easy for the hardware designer of the iPhone when the iPhone was first designed to you know who knew he had this little uh, uh, switch on the side to turn you know the ringer on and off to go over to the people from the operating system and say, oh, I have the switch on the heart, on the on the iPhone. Can you make sure that we have a little, you know, that system wide, this turns off ringers uh, everywhere and, and all the and all the system uh, functions? Yeah, sure. And then he goes on and goes to maybe uh, the guy who's designing the phone app and says, oh, by the way, you know, when you design the phone app, you, you, I've got this hardware button here. You should pick up the setting of that hardware button to work in your phone application. And he's like, oh, yeah, sure, that's a good idea. And then you can, you can go to the user interface design person who designs the software visual interface and says, oh, you know, we should have a little indicator um, that, you know, pops up whenever people toggle that button from, you know, silent to, to non-silent mode. Uh, can we make that happen inside the, the standard UI? And then the GUI designer says, yeah, sure, thanks for letting me know. So you've got the way to, for people from different layers to talk to each other, hardware, OS, uh, applications, GUI, um, and this really makes it easier to create consistent vertical design. And there are other examples of this, right? For example, um, uh, the TomTom uh, uh, the -tom here uh, is another example. The TomTom -tom navigation devices, uh, yeah, also a dying breed as everybody now has either built-in car navigation in their cars or has their smartphone tapped onto their windscreen. Um, but they are excellent examples because here the software, the hardware, it's, it's a one purpose device and everything comes from one company, right? So they were also able to create a very consistent user experience because they can control everything in this case. Um, um, another example is here, the, uh, the, the, the Mac on the right-hand side, of course, you know, Mac OS, similar story to, to iOS, um, also hardware and OS and, and key apps and UI uh, come from one company. Um, and where this, where this doesn't work so well is if when, when you are a company or a, a market, let's say, an ecosystem that works in a horizontal layer uh, uh, faction. So the whole Android market, for example, has this basic challenge that as the manufacturer of the operating system, Google, uh, as, as the per people who make Android, they know kind of what the smartphones look like that they use. There are certain um, form factors that they define, but in the end, you can't be really sure, right? The, the display size could be slightly different from what you, from the list of display sizes that you are aware of, um, or you know, the buttons that are provided exactly could be slightly different. Um, and then of course the problem gets, gets uh, even more difficult when you have the hardware maker, like maybe Samsung, uh, and then you've got the OS from Android, and then Samsung goes back and like we saw in the tablet example that I showed earlier, tries to force some of their own visual design back into the UI, which Android tried to provide for the user. Um, so there are multiple interests at, at, at work here and, and they clash and they often lead to in, in inconsistent user experiences. 
Of course, any third party app that gets developed has the potential of also creating this kind of mess. Um, and then it depends on how close these third party apps can work with a consistent and clearly communicated set of design guidelines um, to be, you know, so that they feel like the built in apps, right? That's, that's usually what users like best if you don't give them a completely different approach, completely different shortcuts in a, in a third party app from what they're already used to. Um, we've got a couple more examples here. Um, the, in, the, in the middle, we're showing a, um, a, a tablet running, uh, running Windows. Uh, again, Microsoft with Windows has a huge challenge at their hand because they don't know what hardware they're running on, right? It could be any kind of PC that somebody assembled in the back of the garage, uh, and it has to kind of run Windows, right? So you cannot, can make very few assumptions about the exact hardware configurations that you have. Apple can check, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe 30 different configurations of their hardware and then they know exactly what kind of Mac uh, they're running on. Am I on an iMac? Am I on a Mac mini or whatever? Um, and uh, another example that, that also Apple is struggling with, for example, is, is CarPlay, right? CarPlay or Android Auto is the, the attempt to put an user interface onto, uh, off, the, off the smartphone into the car, right? To basically show the UI that you already know from your smartphone in the car so that when you get into a car, you plug in your smartphone, your smartphone UI pops up on a, on a convenient screen that's in place in a safe uh, location for you to look at while driving. Um, and, and then it shows you an interface that you already know, so you're very fast. Um, I, I love this. It's great when you ever have to pick up a rental car and you don't want to deal with it. You just plug in your smartphone, your iPhone comes up and you've got your music, you've got your contacts, you know how to call somebody, you know how to operate the, um, you know, the, 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 the sat satellite navigation system rather than having to deal with the one that's built into the car great but that's where you know even a manufacturer like apple who really usually know exactly what kind of hardware they're running on now they have to work with this myriad of different displays they may have touch screens they may not have touch screens they may have controls on the steering wheel they may have a secondary display between you know in front of the user behind the steering wheel uh, the display could be different sizes located in different uh, places in the car um, really tricky and you notice immediately that uh, that's where it gets hard um, to provide a consistent user experience because um, you know carplay yeah it's kind of the same every time but when you get once you get into the question of how do I control it it will be different every time based on the hardware that's actually built into the car all right so I said consistency and predictability um, in the uh, in the starting for for this rule um, and predictability is a, is, a, is a wonderfully simple but uh, principle, but really hard to fulfill, and it gets broken a lot in interfaces. Um, I like to call it the principle of least surprise. What I mean by this is if you're ever struggling with how should my interface react to something that happens, you know, or that the user does, or that, that some external impact, like, you know, I don't know, um, the printer's out of paper or something like that. Um, then the golden rule is always react in your interface so that you minimize the user's surprise. Uh, because surprise is great, you know, when it's your birthday, but it's not something you want to have every day when you work with uh, some kind of productivity application. And surprise often means uh, for the user confusion and then irritation about what the system does. This means two things. First, don't do unexpected things, right? Don't do things that the user doesn't expect at that point in time. And I'll give you some examples in just a second. But it also means uh, don't make things that the user expects to be obviously easy and, and straightforward to do. Don't make those unexpectedly difficult, right? Like, if you want to print something in duplex, that's like one of the standard things people need to do on a printer. So don't make that difficult to, you know, to select in your print dialog. The reason for this rule of predictability, why it's so important is uh, that users like to feel in control. Everybody likes to feel in control. I mean, experts, it may be even more extremely so. Uh, they really want to, but, but, but basically everybody wants to feel competent when they use software, right? Um, when they use a system, when they use technology. Uh, this is almost like the most fundamentally human uh, need to feel competent when you use tech, right? You don't want to feel incompetent. Nobody likes that. 
Um, and when you don't feel in control, when the system does things that you don't expect and you're surprised, you don't feel in control and you don't feel competent and that's not good. So for the last 40, 50 years, we have been very successful in HCI designing systems according to a metaphor that you could call the tool metaphor. We want basically, you know, we want everything to work like a stapler. I press down on this thing and it staples. Like I t I'll tell it what to do and it does it. It does it promptly without delay, without latency, uh, without unexpected results. Um, and, and I feel competent using it. So that's the goal, right, of, of designing the systems. So that's this basic fundamental um, model in which you can usually design most of the interactions with the technology, which is the user initiates an action, the system does it, it responds to it accordingly. Now, I will say that this is something that has helped, has served us really well in the HCI community for the last, you know, 50 years or so, uh, but it is currently under challenge by the, you know, the heavy AI, the deep AI being built into systems. These systems seem to need a different kind of interaction. They are more like a social counterpart that you interact with. Uh, they are less like a tool that, that you just use and that does exactly what you want it to do at the moment when you ask it to. But that's a topic for a different you know, lecture. That's actually a topic for research that we're currently exploring ourselves, how you should be interacting with AI properly, what's the right user interface to AI. But let's keep that part out for now. Let's look at all the technology that is just working as a tool. Um, and the principle of least surprise, here's an example. Um, I once was in a, in a, in a talk where while the talk was happening, suddenly a dialogue popped up on the presenter's laptop in front of everybody in the big screen that said, your battery is fully charged. Now, that's great. Congratulations to you know, the presenter that his battery is fully charged. But I bet you that the presenter was not, that they were surprised by this note in the middle of giving a presentation in front of a full uh, you know, audience. Um, so, I can ask myself as a designer, um, is that the reaction that the user finds the least surprising in that situation? My battery is full and the user is currently running a, you know, a PowerPoint presentation. Should I pop up a dialogue over his presentation saying, oh, your battery is not fully charged? I guess not, right? That's not the least surprising solution. Um, this was driven to an extreme with Clippy. I don't know whether anybody here remembers Clippy, of course, not from personal experience, I hope, uh, but Clippy was in the, in the 90s, um, um, a little thing, a little office assistant, you know, paper clip that would pop up with Microsoft Office um, when you were, for example, writing a letter, right? So it would pop up and t uh, tell you uh, that it could help you with the tasks that you were doing. And this was basically, you know, fundamentally, that's that's good, right? Some help being provided, but it was, it had an, its own initiative. It was doing this. It was popping up at a time when you didn't expect it. So it was really surprising the user. And it quickly led to people being completely annoyed by Clippy, the paperclip. It turned into a meme that was kind of like, you know, the epitome of bad user interface design of something that people just wanted to find out how they turn it off. If you were at that time when you, if you were to search, you know, for what people were looking for online, the, the number one thing that they needed to find out was like, how do I turn off Clippy? Right? This was the most important thing. Um, and when you, when you think about what the system does when it pops things up, like your battery is fully charged, just because some sensor told that the battery is full and it decided to just tell you without paying any attention to your social surroundings or the appropriateness of yelling out at the time, it's like a little you know, obnoxious kid right, that comes in and says, ah, oh, your battery is fully charged. It's like you know, the kid coming in, mom, I'm done on the potty, you know, come over and help me now. Uh, you know, without paying any attention to whether that is actually something you want to know at this time, right? Or everybody else in the audience. Um, people often talk about systems should react like, um, you know, more human uh, responses, right? And they should be human-like assistants. But if I want my system to react like a human, then I certainly don't want it to react like this obnoxious little kid. Um, but I want it to react like a good butler, right? I want it to go, maybe I, um, you know, 
I'm on the up on the presentation, uh, give my presentation, the battery is full. I don't get any hint on that because it doesn't matter at this point, right? It's not a critical event. And then when I go off the stage, you know, my my friendly personal butler will say, <clears throat> Professor Borges, your battery is now completely full, by the way, in case you wanted to know, right? When there's time to tell me that, right? Um, and in a less kind of like obnoxious, you know, attention grabbing way. Um, so that's the principle of least surprise. Don't surprise your users. It's not, it's usually not a good surprise. They don't like surprises in this setting. Because the office assistant, Clippy, was so amazing. I want to show you a little more about it. Uh, I was, this was live, right? I watched this when, uh, when my friend was trying to use her computer um, uh, with a Mac. Uh, the Clippy was not a paperclip. It was a cute little Mac Plus from the early days of, of the Macintosh, right? So it was this little Mac with little feet underneath. And she wanted to, uh, she was working on a PowerPoint presentation um, and she clicked uh, down where, you know, the, the slide number was, right? Because she wanted to, I don't know, edit something there or change something there. And then, whoop, suddenly Clippy popped up, right? In this shape. And it said, this is an object in the master you're trying to select. Um, it's not, it's, it's on the slide master, not in the current slide. Okay, that's useful, right? It tells me what's going on. But then it said, you know, take me to the slide master or tell me about the slide master. Uh, and she had just accidentally clicked in an area where she didn't want to click. She just wanted to continue working, right? She wasn't interested in editing the slide master. Um, however, the only two options she had was take me to the slide master or tell me about the slide master, right? So what she tried, of course, was to just close this thing because there's a little close button here that you may see that as a Mac user, you know, you can click that and make things go away, right? That's very important. So uh, she tried to click that and then it got really surreal because then, you know, Clippy changed and it popped up this dialogue. It said, office assistant, sorry, you must click an option before you can close the assistant. And even worse, please click OK now and then click an option. So she had to click OK on this. That would go back to this other yellow bubble here. Then she had to pick one of the options and then she could click OK, which is completely insane, right? And the best thing about this was this little checkbox, thanks for the tip. I don't know what the designers were thinking when they did this. I think the checkbox that should have been there is like never never ever come back and bugger me again, right? That would be a useful uh, checkbox there, but that didn't exist. Now, um, so that's bad design, obviously, right? This is all of a sudden going into self-initiative, um, becoming initi initiating an action in the interface without the user explicitly requesting it, um, doing it in a way that distracts the user from the current task, and then actually not going away easily when you when the user is trying to tell you that it's not the right moment to tell you this, right? Uh, now, there's a couple things I want to say about this. I met the guy who designed Clippy, but he was a researcher, um, and the original design of Clippy as an office assistant was way more involved. It was actually a fairly complex Bayesian rules network of things that would carefully learn about your behavior and then at some point it would decide that now it has learned enough about what you're doing and it would come and and suggest things to you so yes it was an in, uh, it had its own initiative it was sort of uh, self-acting but it was designed originally in the research team that did this in microsoft research to do this very carefully after learning a lot about what you're doing but that didn't seemed to make it over into the product. When it was productized, um, the engineers decided to just give this thing a simple API to program Clippy as a, as a developer, right? You, because you have to somehow include it in your code. And then Clippy would just be basically, you could tell Clippy to appear, make Clippy appear now and ask the following questions. And that was not the original design. The original design was way more intricate and was really more indirect so that you could create this little AI, if you want, that was learning from you, what you were doing and then carefully uh, starting to initiate, uh, introduce itself. So Clippy was kind of messed up in productization. Uh, it was a gr great research idea that was sort of, you know, badly implemented. Um, but this is important to understand. You don't want people to be surprised, right? Here's another example. Um, 
when you, uh, especially the, in the US, um, you have um, uh, escape do doors, like um, fire escape doors that uh, have no normal handles, but they have these push bars, right? So you, you push against this, this bar here and then this thing opens. Now, apparently, um, somebody wanted to avoid accidental use of this emergency exit. So this emergency exit door works the following way. I don't know whether they can read this. You have to press the bar for three seconds and then the door lock will open 50 seconds later. Apparently they wanted to avoid that people just, you know, use this casually to escape or to run away or to steal something, I don't know. Um, now imagine there's a fire, you're running towards the door, behind you is a, a throng of people that also really want to get out of the burning building. You reach this door. And now you turn around and calmly say to the masses of people that are rushing towards you, can you please all stop just for 18 seconds because I need to press this door handle for three seconds. And then we 15 seconds, we need to wait. And then the door will open. Well, by the time you try to say that you'll be squished into a bloody pulp by the mass of people rushing to the door behind you, right? So that's not good design, right? Um, anyway, so that's, that's the story about, you know, predictability and, um, uh, and, and, and the principle of least surprise. Next thing up is providing feedback and being responsive. Um, you may recall the seven stages of action um, where we understood that when you provide complete and continuous feedback, uh, this really helps to bridge the gulf of evaluation, right? Um, each user action that you do, that the user does requires some kind of feedback. Um, if it's just a key press in a word editor um, or just selecting a single menu, then the feedback can be very subtle, right? It's short and subtle uh, for interactions that happen a lot and that are small and that are not very impactful. Um, so clearly you don't want a text editor uh, like Word uh, when you press you know, the, the A key to enter the letter A, you don't want a dialogue to pop up. You press the letter A and then you confirm the dialogue with an okay, right? That would be a little bit too much. Um, but if you do more, you know, more important actions, infrequent actions, longer actions, main things like saving a file, deleting a file, you want more noticeable feedback, right? That, that clearly tells you what's going on. Um, and this whole feedback thing is something where you can really see why the graphic user interface um, outshines the textual user interface in many aspects of usability. Why? Because in a GUI, you can show the objects as little things on the desktop, right? If I have a file, uh, an image file, I can show a little icon on the desktop that represents that image file. I can even show a little preview of what's inside the image. And then the user can click on that image and then say, you know, delete it, drag it to the trash or open it or copy it or move it, whatever, right? Rename it. So it's a very easy object selection and then the action kind of sequences, object action model of graphical user interfaces is really good to provide feedback because the moment I click on it, it's selected, I show a highlighted state, um, then the user knows I've now selected this object and not the one next to it. And then they can select a menu item that says duplicate this file, for example, right? It's very easy to visualize the object state. It's very easy to visualize the actions because I can show a menu bar and drop down menus that are all the available commands right there in front of me that I can select from. Um, I don't need to remember them like I would have to in a command line based interface. You know, think about the same interaction of duplicating a file in a command line based interface. First of all, a command line based interface greets you with a friendly little, you know, triangle. That's all, right? There's usually nothing there. If you want to see what directory you're currently at, you need to type in, you know, uh, what's the current directory. And if you want to see what's inside that directory or folder, you need to type, you know, on Unix, you need to type ls to see a list of the files that are in that folder. They are only listed textually. You don't get a little representation of what's inside these files, like you know, the image of the flower. Um, you just see flower.jpg, right? That's all you see. And then if you want to delete or if you want to duplicate one of those files, you would have to um, you enter a command for duplicating a file textually. You have to know this command by heart because you don't have a list of commands to select from, from a menu item. You need to remember it and type it in. Uh, you can make mistakes by typing it in and all these kinds of things can happen. And then you have to enter the right file name uh, that you just saw in the listing in the directory there. 
and you have to make sure you don't type the file name wrong because you know otherwise you may delete the, or, or duplicate the wrong file so it's messy right and i cannot see which file i'm actually picking from the list because the list is just shown in my command line and i'm typing my command beneath that it's a complete disconnect right the objects are not active things i can do stuff to directly this whole concept of direct manipulation in the graphical user interface is really powerful in that way and this is essentially what made the pc revolution possible right without the graphical user interface computers would not have had the chance to become so proliferate uh, and, and so ubiquitous in, in, in the modern world. Anyway, so that's why, you know, providing feedback and, and providing responses to uh, and, 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 and acting in a timely fashion is actually easier in a GUI because you have visual representations of things, of objects that you can show that feedback on, right? Um, the thing you want to make sure is that people can answer the, these, these fundamental questions they often ask themselves while they are inside an interaction, right? Um, where am I currently? Like, what's my current working directory? What, what files are currently in front of me in, in this directory? Or what's the system doing right now? Is it, you know, copying files or is it loading something? Is an application launching? Is it shutting down? What's going on, right? Um, these are things, and if you ask these questions and you don't get an answer, it's super frustrating. I mean, you know this, right? When you when you got your computer and it's just hanging there and it's showing you, you know, that little clock, you know, sand uh, sand clock, the hourglass turning over, or it's you know, in, in, on the on the Mac, it's showing you the what people like to call the spinning pizza of death, um, you know, that little beach ball that that twirls and means that it's busy with something. It's frustrating because you don't know what's going on. You don't know how long it's going to take. You don't know why it's currently busy. You don't know if it's hung up or whether it is still, um, you know, working on something useful. So I want to show you an example from a, a, an old Windows dialog. We're going to talk about responsiveness, by the way, uh, more uh, in, in, in a later part of this lecture. But I want to show you an example from a Windows dialog, Windows 2000, this is long ago, um, that was there for copying files. And there are so many things wrong with this dialogue. I don't even know where to start. Uh, the first thing is, um, okay, it's telling me that it's copying. That's good. But from where am I copying to where? From installer to installer. That's super useful, right? That doesn't tell me which way I'm copying it. I, I can't even verify whether I'm copying correctly from you know my USB stick to my hard drive or whether I make, made a mistake and I'm copying the other way around. Um, the next thing that's 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 wrong about this is is this animation. You you probably re remember this animation, right? So when as you do this copying, what's happening is that there's a little bit of paper flying from the left folder over to the right folder. And the amazing thing is when that piece of paper flies over there, it disappears and a new piece of paper appears on the left hand side. What's happening here is it's just a brain dead animation, right? That just keeps going through the same seven images again and again and again. There is no actual, you know, there aren't actually paper you know, pieces being added to the right hand side. It's always the same animation. Um, and so this could be useful if, for example, what I'm copying is a document of 52 pages, then each page here could actually be represented by one page flying over there. But that's not the case. It's a brain dead animation. It's the same animation when I'm copying, you know, a, a binary executable um, and the pages don't mean anything. Um, what's even worse, if you actually were to pull the internet you know, connection, like the, 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 the LAN cable, and you don't have Wi-Fi, um, this animation would continue. It would continue to happily fly from the left to the right because it's just an animation. It doesn't actually check on whether copying is taking place. It's just there as long as this dialogue is open. So it's a completely useless animation. I can see how you know Bill Gates was walking down you know the hallways of Microsoft Central in Redmond campus, and then he ran into this you know young inexperienced intern that had just come over from the local high school, and he said, um, "So you got anything to do?" And he's like, "No, okay. Why don't you create myself me some you know completely useless animations that just show paper flying from one folder to the other? Don't worry about whether it means anything. We'll just use this to entertain the user while the copying is happening, right?" And this intern went off and probably did his thing. 
So that's what it seems like, right? It, it doesn't mean anything. There's something even worse. If you were to, if this dialogue was copying, and let's assume the copying finishes, it could happen, and it was likely, that it stopped at a moment where the last piece of paper here was actually in midair, flying from one folder to the other. And then suddenly the dialogue disappeared. And I can see, you know, my I can see somebody, my mom would go like, wait a minute, that last page, it hadn't been copied yet. Where is it gone? You know, it's not in the starting folder. It was in the air, it's not in the, in the, in the target folder. Did it, you know, like fall under the table or something? Where did it go, right? So that's really bad use of animation because you are actually leading the user into a false mental model, right? Into a false conceptual model. They think that this animation means something when, when it doesn't. So that's wrong about this animation. Um, but it gets better, right? It, you know the, the progress bar beneath this? Oh, I love progress bars. They're, they're awesome if they work. And they are the worst if they don't work. So this progress bar tells us 55 seconds remaining. Now, please raise your hand if you trust this estimate. Yeah, you guys have been using computers too long, right? This is not true. It's not 55 seconds. We know that, right? Um, it, but the worst thing about this is it's not even roughly 55 seconds. Oftentimes, this dialogue jumps, right, wildly. There's this great story of, you know, the, the, the man who was driving home uh, to, to his wife uh, from his job and, and he was a Windows user and she said, when are you going to be home? And he said, um, in five minutes. No, wait, two hours. Oh, no, three days. No, wait, five seconds. Right? That's the typical behavior of, of these dialogues when they are really bad at estimating how long the process is actually going to take. And that's terrible interface design, right? Don't do that. So there's two things wrong with this dialogue uh, or with this progress bar. First of all, 55 seconds, I don't care. What I care about is is it going to take long enough for me to, you know, check my email? Or is it going to take so long that I can go and make myself a copy? Or is it going to take so long that I can go and have my lunch break? Or should I come back tomorrow? Right? These are the kinds of questions that people are interested in. They don't care whether it's 55 or 58 seconds, right? They won't look at their stopwatch and measure that. Um, so I don't want this precise information. I want a rough estimate. And I want that would also be how should I say it? More honest. Yeah? It would be more honest because the computer doesn't know that it's 55 seconds. It's suggesting a precision that it actually doesn't have. So <clears throat> what systems have been moving to since then, and today you will see that when you when you do a, um, um, a progress dialogue, is that they will tell you about a minute, right? Or a few more seconds, right? Those are the kinds of things I'm interested in, or about two minutes or three minutes. That's a good verbal estimate that makes sense. Okay, so that about this, this, this dialogue. Don't suggest precision that you don't have. If you don't know how long it takes, be honest and say, I'm still calculating, I'm still estimating, and tell the user. And only once you have a reasonable estimate, show that reasonable estimate as an estimate, and then it should always progress linearly. If anything, it should become shorter. Don't make it become significantly longer. Rather do a, you know, a slightly pessimistic estimate in the beginning. And then, you know, if things go faster than you anticipated, you know, usually people aren't going to complain, right? Then it's not going to throw them off. Um, and then we get to the progress bar itself. How many people here have seen a progress bar that advances and then at 99% it stops and it sits there forever, right? That's terrible. This is completely useless. Don't do a progress bar if you can't do a linear progress. The only thing that makes sense in a progress bar, think about it, is when I look at the progress bar in this state, I expect the thing to be halfway done. So if I have been waiting for two minutes to get to this point, I expect the rest to take two more minutes. That's, that's why the progress bar is there. If it, however, advances and then stops at the end or suddenly jumps in giant hoops and then stops forever, it completely defeats the use of the progress bar. It's not no longer a linear estimate. And the worst designs, however, go to 99%, sit there for a while, and then they go to 100%, and you're like, oh, finally. And then the dialogue goes away and comes back and says, now I'm finishing the installation or whatever it is, right? And there's another progress bar. How useless is that? It doesn't help me at all. 
it's very easy to program technically. I understand that, you know, if you're a bored, stupid, lazy programmer, it's quick to build that, but it's completely useless for the user. They want to know how long is the overall process going to take. I remember in, in, the, in the best times, Windows had like installations, had these progress bars that would pop up and fill themselves at lightning speed. And there would be hundreds of them. And you're like, wow, this is a very fast system. It's doing all these progress bars, right? But they were completely useless, right? They weren't actually helping me in estimating how long the installation was going to take. So understand what progress bars are for, build them right, make them advance linearly, and never ever freeze at 99%. You know, that's just evil. All right, I think you now got the general gist that I don't like bad progress bars. Um, I want to tell, show you a little bit more about menu selection. Um, and this is to, to show you that interface design is really a fine art in some places. It's about the small details that make the difference whether something feels right or whether they feel somehow wrong. So um, I'm going to show you this using videos. Um, because uh, this is otherwise hard to catch. So here's an example of, or maybe before I show you this video, I'm gonna ask you, that's even better. What happens when you select a menu item on your computer? So you drop down a menu, you know, and you select an item. What, what do you think, just out of your mind, uh, what you remember, what happens visually, I mean? The menu bar is up, the, the drop down menu is open, you pick an item from that menu, what happens? Uh, sure. Yeah, I just clicked on something and yeah, I created a new file. So it just happens when I click on the button, it just happens. Nothing okay. else pops up. <laughs> okay. Okay. So you're right. Uh, you know, new file obviously opens a file dialog and that's usually the overwhelming thing that happens. And that's good feedback because you get the dialog that you're looking for, but I'm talking about a finer effect. I'm going to show you what I mean. When let's look at this, this is a, a drop down menu. Uh, in Mac OS Catalina, and we are selecting an, a menu item, like new finder window, for example. And now pay attention to what happens. Did you see that? Just before the menu went away, we selected the new folder thing, something happened. Um, let me see, maybe I can play that again. Um, I'm gonna go back. I'm gonna play that one more time for you. It blinked once, do you see that? So what's going on there is you go down to the new folder thing, where you click, it gets unselected briefly, it gets selected again, and then the menu fades away very quickly in a fast animation that probably by a zoom, you don't even see that fading effect. It's really a fraction of a second, but the blinking you should have been able to see. And you might say, well, who cares, right? But this is super essential because what that does is the moment you click and then release, you know, you actually only select when you release, right? Um, you may actually not be 100% sure which menu item you selected because your menu, your mouse might have slid just a little selecting something else, right? And you want to be sure that you selected the right item. So if the menu just goes away, if you were just to remove it at that moment when the user lets go and you're like, okay, I know what he selected, I'm just going to delete everything and, and make it invisible you would actually take away an important piece of feedback for the user. I'm going to show you something um, here um, from a, uh, an installation. Uh, this, is a, this is an installation of a GNOME uh, Linux distribution. Uh, and this is a CD version, so the one that you can uh, boot right off the CD. Uh, and sure, you can configure it to, to behave differently. Um, uh, but, it, and if you have a full installation, it actually uh, does a little fade out effect when you select a menu. But if you just boot from the CD, it doesn't have that fade out effect. And I'm show, going to show you what that looks like. Right? So, again, I'm going to go back and do that again. It just goes away. And if you were to use that, Right, so in the one moment it's it's there, and the next moment it it actually just is basically the menu is gone, your selection is gone, everything's gone. It feels like you're walking on ice. It feels like you're not really sure what did I just select? Did I pick the right menu option here? Did I really select undo or did I maybe select redo? Um, what what just happened? Right? Um, it's a very fine detail, but it's important. This is feedback that's that's designed carefully. Um, if you were to run a classic installation of macOS from macOS nine times or, or you know any any all the way back to system one, you could actually 
the user could select how many times he wanted this uh, this blinking effect to happen because some people like it to be more pronounced and more clear, like it would flash one or two or even three times for you, depending on what you selected as a user. This this user setting has gone away in Mac OS X, um, but it's it shows how much attention um, you know needs to be paid to these small details. Okay. Um, as we talk about feedback, um, it's not just about visual feedback. Of course, it's also about auditory feedback um, and haptic feedback as well. This is why it's so important to actually uh, be able to feel keys, right? We all know that when we type on our smartphones, um, if you don't look at the key, the keys at the moment when you're typing, after a while, your fingers will just drift away from the, where the keys are because you have nothing to feel, right? You don't actually sense the keys. So there's nothing to, for your fingers to orient themselves on. And also, when you tap, you don't get a physical feedback, usually on your smartphone touchscreen, uh, that you actually tap the key. Now, this can be simulated by shaking the whole device with a little tap um, that, that makes the whole screen vibrate. Um, so that you have a feeling as if you tapped, and that actually you can you can fool the the sense of haptics quite well by uh, of humans, um, but the the this 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 pre sensing of the key before you actually type uh, anything is super important. That's why it's easy to type eyes free on a physical keyboard, but it's really hard on a glass keyboard. So haptic feedback can sometimes be um, um, you know. Uh, taken care of through, for example, um, uh, acoustic feedback, right? If you don't have uh, haptic feedback, you can sometimes simulate it with, with acoustics. Um, uh, but if you ever you know, bought, it, bought a ticket at the, uh, you know, ticket automate, uh, auto, uh, ticket machines of the Deutsche Bahn in the, in the, in the railway station, um, you will see that if you don't get any feedback, it feels really weird. You know? Or if there's only visual feedback, you're kind of missing something. There's something missing in the, in the physical interaction. So, even though physical keys are maybe half a cent more expensive in a device design than adding a capacitive sensor because mechanical moving stuff is always more expensive, um, consider using it for if you ever design any embedded device or IoT things, consider adding a few buttons um, if they really make operation easier. Okay. Um, we actually went uh, so far and simulated haptic feedback in a research prototype where we uh, you know, glued a mag magnet to the user's finger and then we had these electromagnets on a, in a field and they would actually create electromagnetic fields that would give you haptic feedback even when you were in the air above the, um, above the screen. So that's what we did with haptic feedback in our research. Now, this was number four, feedback. Um, number five is minimizing memory load. Um, as we know, short-term memory is limited. Um, there used to be this number of the seven, magical number seven. Uh, more recent research showed that actually the magical number is more like four. So short-term memory of the user can hold roughly four items, uh, maybe one more, maybe one less, depending on you know how alert you are, whether you had a coffee and stuff, stuff like this. So what that means is in a user interface, I don't want to overload the user's short-term memory with stuff because I want to make sure that they actually um, can operate the system competently, right? So you shouldn't ask the user to um, like type in a password and then ask them five minutes later, oh, now type in that password again um, that you just entered uh, when they didn't have a chance to write it down yet or something like this. Or you might give people, um, you know, a, you display a URL in a text and then you say later on, hey, oh, by the way, you remember the URL I showed earlier, that's where you find the help page, right? That's bad design. Uh, don't make people type in things twice if the computer, you know, um, if you if the user typed it in once, for example, they typed in um, their address, you know, then remember that kind of stuff. Don't make it uh, type, make them type it in twice. Um, and when you display information, uh, you should place it so that it you use Gestalt laws so that it's easy to parse visually. What I mean by that is um, remember all the Gestalt laws that tell us this is how you group something, and this is how you keep things apart, and this is how people perceive something as a unit, right? Uh, law of proximity and the law of closed shape, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these you can use to structure your UI so that it's easy to parse visually, and that makes it easier for people to memorize the interface and mem minimizes their memory load. 
But probably the most direct link to minimizing memory load comes in the form of help. If your system requires any codes or abbreviations or keyboard shortcuts or things like that, uh, or uses special terminology, then give users easy access to a help page that they can open up to see these things. Um, I'll show you an example of that on the next slide. Um, just before that, maybe um, this is another reason why GUIs have an advantage, right? In, in a GUI, I can show the user all the commands that are available. Uh, the command line interface requires the user to remember the available commands in their head and then type them in. Yes, there is auto completion that helps you a bit with that, um, but um, you know, usually it's, um, it's easier to show interface elements or commands available in the graphical user interface. So don't write a, you know, a setup wizard in which you ask the user to enter some information or pick, some, pick a username or something like that, and then ask them to remember information from step one again in, in, in step seven, right? That's, that's not a good design. Here's a good design. Um, you can actually, um, when you, if you ever struggle with, oh, how do I create, you know, um, a, I don't know, um, a copyright sign on this keyboard? you can open what's called the keyboard viewer on the Mac and it will show you a tiny little keyboard. And what's better is if you hold down any of the uh, modifier keys, like, you know, here, for example, the this alt key, this option key is being held down, uh, either physically on the keyboard or by clicking it in this little keyboard viewer, it will actually show you the option key um, uh, layout of that keyboard. So you can see all the special characters at one, at one glance, where they are and how to type them if you want to type them often with a keyboard shortcut. Of course, you can also pick them from a list graphically, but you know, maybe you want to learn how to type a copyright uh, sign efficiently because you use it a lot. Um, and any dead keys that only add apostrophe, uh, add ac accents of certs to, to the existing letter rather than creating a letter on their own are being highlighted in orange here in this. And here you can see we're holding down uh, option and shift here in the lower part of this. And that shows us that there are yet another uh, set of special uh, symbols that we can create by holding down both of these keys at the same time. Another example is right from Keynote that I'm using to present to you here today. Um, if I go to the help menu, it doesn't just have the usual, yeah, yeah here's the help uh, system for Keynote, but it actually has right there a well, a shortcut, if you want, to the keyboard shortcuts, right? It's a direct pointer to the page of Keynote where it shows you nicely what are the keyboard shortcuts that I can use in Keynote. Because when you're presenting, uh, you often need to use keyboard shortcuts because, you know, fiddling around with the mouse isn't possible in presentation mode. Um, and there are some really useful keyboard shortcuts that you should know as a presenter. Um, so that's good design, right? That gives you access to these, you know, through help pages to this information that people might not have in their short-term memory. Um, or may have forgotten because they haven't used the software for a while. Now, uh, moving on, um, error handling. Errors happen, right? We know people make mistakes. We've talked about slips and mistakes in Norman's book. And one of the reasons why I shared this information about slips and mistakes with you is I wanted to I wanted you to get used to the fact that people make these kinds of mistakes, these especially these like un in unintentional or um, um, non-intentional uh, slips that just happen because you were just a little absent-minded, right? So we need to deal with these. Um, they will happen. We can minimize the chance of them happening by designing our interface carefully. And that's always the best if you can avoid these errors to happen. Great, right? Then the user won't go down that dark uh, path, but they still will make some sorts of mistakes. So in these cases, you need them to help recover from them. Why? Because any errors lead to stress, right? Um, <coughs> people often say, oh, I want to build a user interface that can detect human emotion. And it's a super difficult research topic even today to detect, you know, what kind of emotional state is Ezra in right now, right? We don't know. It's, it's, it's super hard to read that from like the user's face and their whatever body sensors and what else we could do. But there's one very simple way to predict the user's emotions. If you write a piece of software and that piece of software has a routine that displays an error message, I can guarantee you that the user is pissed off. Nobody likes error messages, right? When the user sees an error message, they are not in a happy state. 
I can tell you that. So that part I can I can promise you. So what that means is whenever we are in an error situation in our software, we need to be extra careful to be constructive, to be simple in how we offer help, to be very concrete about what we tell the user about the mistake that just happened and how they can recover from it. So they need comfortable, easy instructions on how to get out of the mess that they just ended up in. That also means that if somebody just makes a single mistake, the system shouldn't change irreversibly uh, by just pressing one letter on my keyboard. I shouldn't be able to delete my entire hard disk, right? Um, or if I can, then I should be easily able to revert and say, oops, I didn't mean to do that. Let me back up. And that recovery is usually the best choice, right? Giving people this undo option. So what are ways to avoid mistakes in the first place? Well, for example, uh, if you ask the user to um, type in uh, their username when they log on to a system, then they can mistype it. If you show them a list of usernames that they can select their username from, they can't mistype it. So that's an easier way of avoiding mistyping. Right? The same thing applies to anything where users are typing in something that's really picked from a small set of things, like uh, the maybe a city name or street name in, in, in Aachen or something like this. All of these things can often be pulled from a list. And you can have people start typing it and then autocomplete for them um, uh, with a clever algorithm so that you avoid having entries that are illegal um, to begin with. Um, another example is if people are supposed to type in their age in years, don't let them type in letters, right? Just turn off the letters to be able to enter there so that they don't make a mistake. Um, if you are looking for, if you say like, oh, I can't write a system where people cannot make mistakes. Well, look at arcade machines, arcade game machines, right? Um, if you play a round of Pac-Man, there are no user errors you can make in the operation. Yes, you can get horribly eaten by, you know, Binky and the other little ghosts, but you don't have the situation that people say like, oh, you entered the high score name you're there, but you made a mistake. You need to go back and do this again. It doesn't happen, right? So these systems are carefully designed not to have any user error messages other than, you know, the horrible deaths you can die in the game itself. Um, another example is um, when you um, enter a file name to save a file with, um, then um, the system can help you by, for example, changing these illegal characters that you entered and proposing to use other characters that are legal in the file name. You know, every system has some characters that cannot be really used in file names. Um, like on Windows, you can't use a slash in a file name because that's, you know, the path divider. On the Mac, uh, the, the colon is a, is a sign that you cannot use because it used to be the path divider in, on, on the Macintosh. Um, and so what, for example, the classic Mac OS did is if you typed a colon, it would just replace that with a hyphen instead. Um, it would do that silently, which is kind of a bit against the principle of least surprise, because if I meant to type a colon, why am I suddenly seeing a hyphen? So a little bit of a hint that it was changed would be in order, I think. But at least I wasn't ending up with an illegal file name that I had to manually go and correct. If you want to see the worst dialogue that I've ever seen telling me that I made a mistake in my file name, you don't need to look any further than Mac OS X in its current versions. If I type in a name with a colon now, it's actually gotten worse than uh, classic Mac. It just tells you the name A colon B cannot be used. And I don't know who wrote this, this by dialogue message. It's almost evil in, in how it phrases it. It says, try using a name with, you know, maybe fewer characters, maybe they were too long, or maybe you use punctuation marks that I don't like. It's, it's like this, it's like it's trying to give you a riddle. It's like Gandalf trying, telling, giving you like a magical message that you're supposed to decode. Like, what's the problem, right? Why isn't just telling me colons don't work in file names, use something else, buddy, right? That would have been easy, but it would have required to type and design more than one error message. And somebody was just incredibly lazy designing that part of the finder interface of Mac OS. So that's really bad design. Now, um, if people do make mistakes, and they will, uh, then offer them a way to reverse, right? Offer them a way to undo what they did. Um, ideally, don't just offer an undo of the last step, but un offer undos of several steps. You know, good software has that, like drawing software, etc., that will let you step back many steps in your history. 
um, this lowers the anxiety. This is an interesting side effect because now users know errors are, are correctable. So they're no longer like, ooh, I need to make sure I hit the right key, otherwise I'm destroying things. And they will actually be encouraged to try out new stuff. If I have a, uh, you know, if I'm using Photoshop and I know I can step back many, many steps, I'm going to try that crazy, you know, pop art filter and see what it does because I know I can revert, right? So it encourages people to learn and, and explore stuff for more. Um, and ideally, this happens, you know, at multiple undo levels. In fact, undo is a research topic, right? It's not as simple as you might think because there is undo of a single last action. So just going back one state, and that's something that you nowadays you get that rolled even into modern GUI toolkits, right? They will give you persistent storage that has undo uh, functions built in. If you write a modern like iOS app, for example, you get core data as a data model and it will just give you the option to go back to the last state of the database for free, right? You don't need to code anything. You just add, add an undo button and say, this is undo button and, and you're done. Um, but going back one step is not the whole story, right? You wanna actually be able to go back multiple steps um, and oftentimes you need undo at multiple levels. So for example, let's say I have a, a drawing in Photoshop open and I go back a few steps, but I actually really discovered that I need an earlier version of this drawing, right? That I did maybe, you know, three weeks ago. And then I need an undo versioning kind of thing on the level of files and file versions, not just in the current app while I'm editing uh, uh, the current file. So it's a tricky business. Um, uh, Photoshop, this is a short video. Actually, you can, undo several actions you've done um, you can and you can do that not just in a single sort of um, sequential step you can even select which actions you want to undo maybe you did five things but step three out of five was something you didn't mean to do you now want to do those five things but without step three photoshop lets you do that because in graphical editing this is something that actually comes up quite often how i applied this you know uh, more effect. I don't, I need to remove that, but everything else I did, I want to keep, I don't want to go back and, and redo everything since then. I just want to undo that one intermediate step. And you can do that in Photoshop. You can actually even delete the history of actions and you can then undo that delete of the actions uh, of the history um, from the menu. So it's, it's mind boggling. Um, I'm going to show you a little video that does a few of these examples here. So here we see uh, a logo, somebody steps back through the action sequence here. You can see individual steps like the move or the free transform. Um, um, these are all individual steps that you can do. You can delete uh, these things out of the history, but you can actually say, oh no, I didn't mean to delete these earlier states. I'm going to bring that back. So you're now working on an undo stack on top of an undo stack, right? Um, mind blowing, I know. Anyway, so. Uh, Rule number seven, these are now, uh, as we get farther to the back, the, the rules are becoming quicker to, to talk about. Um, designing clear exits and closed dialogues. This is something that isn't quite obvious, not as obvious as the ones we've talked about so far, but um, there are a lot of questions I already mentioned that people ask themselves oftentimes inside a user interface. You know, as a designer, you have to say, what's the user, what's the task, what's the context, right? You know, the, the three questions when I shake you awake at 3 a.m. in the morning. But what a user often asks themselves when they're interacting with the system, where am I? What can I do here? And how the hell do I get back to where I just was? And these are the three questions that you should, that your system should answer. And you can help, well, step number one and two, we've already talked about, right? This is about visualizing state, where am I? And visualizing available actions and feedback, what can I do here? Um, and how do I get back to where I was is something that when you design clear exits, uh, you can provide with uh, with your interface design. Clear exits or, or closed dialogues that tell me when something is complete are things that really help to, to get back to a safe state. So for example, a quit option in an action or a back button helps to do that. And um, closed dialogues in general help people feel that they know when they're done with something. That's actually surprisingly difficult sometimes. Um, but if you know you're complete with a certain action, like buying something online, it allows you to relax and say, okay, I can take a breath. I know this order is got done now. This thing is getting shipped to me. My mind is free for the next step. I'm going to show you a little dialogue uh, from Amazon uh, that shows that in, in a little way. So here I am ordering a dual uh, a, a milk frother. And there are lots of steps I need to go through, right? Uh, I need to... Uh, 
um, you know, add this to the basket and then I need to proceed to the checkout. I need to switch to the right account. I need to sign in, enter my password. I need to pick a delivery address. And all the time I'm still like, oh, I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet, right? I need to choose a payment method. And uh, I've, you know, I can now review what I have here. And now I can click on the buy now button, right? Notice that changed its name here. And when you're done with that, you actually get a message that says, thank you, your order has been placed in green, right? Um, and in the old design of Amazon, this was even bigger. It has gotten a little smaller because there's this annoying ad right next to it now. Uh, but this is a clear message to the user uh, that you can relax, right? You're done. You've closed the, you've confirmed the order and you've completed that state. So providing that kind of closure to the user is good. On the other hand, um, you know, this is a kind of funny interface where I don't know what they were thinking, or maybe it got lost in translation. Um, this is from a from a smartphone, uh, a Samsung phone that says, oh, connection was lost. What do you want to reconnect? And you, your two options are yes or okay. Hmm, I wonder what I'm supposed to do there. You know, if, if those things do the same things, by the way, then uh, why is there a dialog box anyway, right? Why doesn't it just reconnect automatically? So that's not a good design. Good design. Anyway, we already talked about help and documentation in the sense that you help minimize users' memory load, but help and documentation has, has a more complex role to play. And again, TK students know this kind of stuff very well. Um, typically, help is not just one thing you add at one level to your app. You have a hierarchy of help systems. Um, you start with things like tooltips. You all know tooltips, right? I hover over something, uh, and when I hover over it, you know, the box pops up and says, this is what you can do here. Um, they can show very little information, but they're extremely easy and fast to access, and they often get you out of a pickle when you just have forgotten which button you need to press right now. Next up, you've got, you know, your online help, tutorials, references, maybe these little uh, help sheets like I showed you with the keyboard to help for Keynote. If I'm just trying to remember the keyboard shortcut for getting to a particular slide number, I can look in the keyboard shortcuts. I don't need to read the whole manual. But if I'm not familiar with Keynote's concept of slide numbers at all, I may need to read the manual, right? And that's then the next step of going through the documentation. And that goes all the way to printed documentation. You know, today, uh, these days, we hardly ever get um, you know documentation documentation on dead trees anymore, which maybe is good for the planet. Um, we get it as PDFs, and um, sometimes it's still nice to have a little book on the side because it has uh, um, extremely good uh, resolution and, and uh, reading quality. It's an extra screen, if you like, on the side of your real screen, so you don't need to share your real screen with the application and the documentation. Um, and you can leave through it and put markers into it and can share it with others. So printed documentation does have its place in, in, in certain situations. But be aware that even though you may provide printed documentation or, or uh, an extensive PDF reference, users usually don't read manuals, right? That's a sad reality. Um, there's two kinds of people in the world. There are readme readers and install clickers. Um, and many people belong to the faction of install clickers. They will first do all these things, then will mess up everything horribly, and then maybe read the manual, or usually they'll post a question on Stack Overflow and ask why things aren't working. Um, so you have to be aware that you may provide documentation, but you cannot rely on people having read that, right? Um, there are ways to provide more active help than that. Uh, for example, with assistants and wizards, they are often useful. Um, but we have to be aware that when you run an assistant or a wizard, uh, the system is taking over initiatives to, to a certain degree, uh, which breaks rule three. So it has to be done carefully and the user really has to agree to, yes, I want to be guided through the installation process for the software, for example, right? Um, and then you don't want to overload people's short-term memory with, with complex instructions and memory and, 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 and information. Uh, by the way, it's interesting. Did you ever notice that um, on macOS, these things are called assistants. On Windows, they're called wizards. I want you to reflect just for a fraction of a second. What kind of picture of yourself does each of these names suggest? To me, if something's called an assistant, it suggests to me that I'm in control as the user and this thing will assist me in doing something. I like that. A wizard 
is a mighty, all-powerful being that could probably turn me into a pile of dust at any time. Uh, and that I am now sort of the, you know, the, the, the little unknowing student of, right? So that's kind of some of the more subtle effects that naming things in a user interface can have on the relationship that the user builds with the technology. All right, um, we have diverse users, right? We have user needs that range um, from the, 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 the experience that people have with software all the way to questions like, um, what, are the, what, are the, what is their domain background, their knowledge in, in the domain that the system is in, what is their technical understanding, et cetera. So lots of different options here. The, the most frequent one is that people who haven't used the system a lot will want more explanations, right? They will need more frequent um, instructions on how things work. Whereas if you have users who have used the system for a while, will want the interaction to speed up. They don't want to be interrupted by instructions and, and, guide, uh, and, and helping uh, dialogues anymore. They don't want the assistant. They want to go through the, doing it themselves. Uh, they will be the ones that value keyboard shortcuts. Ideally, you can configure them yourself. So if you're a big VI fan or Emacs fan, you can configure your whole system to work with those shortcuts. Um, macro recording, so I can record frequent uh, tasks into a single key press. Programmability of the interface, so I can really you know, drive it myself or, or change menu items or add menu items even. And um, you know, avoiding unnecessary feedback for their understanding um, of the system. Then different age ranges have different expectations of the interface too. Don't fall into the trap. It's a very common trap to just think old users, that's like stupid users and they hate technology. And young users, that's like totally smart people who love technology. Uh, it's a, a dangerous stereotype to fall into uh, because I've seen people who are in their 80s who just love using uh, WhatsApp because it lets them connect with their grandchildren, right? Um, it's just that the expectations are different. People tend to expect more payoff from the system um, the older they get, and they are less excited about, you know, just futzing around with the system for the sake of futzing around with it. Um, we have something that is not the same as age, that is technology affinity, which you can translate to enjoying to play with gadgets, right? And many from the, the audience here of this class today, you have a technical background, you study a technical uh, um, program, you probably enjoy playing around with technical gadgets to a certain degree, right? But we just have to acknowledge that there are people who really, really, really don't. They really just want to get stuff done. And for them, it's very different to having to configure a system three times because it crashed twice we're kind of like we take it as a challenge and we we master the interface and then we're like okay i did that and other people are just incredibly annoyed by this and don't want to do this so be aware of that now if you provide information or if you provide an expert user interface that is very quick and and gives little feedback um you have to make sure that you don't uh you know exclude novices from using it you may have to provide uh, a focus you have to maybe decide for one user group, or you may have to decide to create a novice mode and expert mode in your UI that people can then switch to if they want to. Um, this is hard to do because, um, as you can see here, in this, uh, in, if you provide an expert user interface, and now I leave the software alone for three months and I come back to it, I may have forgotten a lot about it. So how do I use it now? Here's an example of a research project um, that um, a colleague of mine did when he was still a PhD student at Stanford. Um, and I really liked this approach because it shows a nice transition from expert to novice, or from novice to expert and back implicitly just by how the user acts. So the way this works is you have to imagine this is a pencil with a pen based interface for interacting with a large whiteboard, right? So what you did is uh, to pop up a menu, the new user would hold down the pen at a location on the screen and after a moment, the pop-up would appear. And the pop-up would be this menu that you see there um, that is like you move an item or zoom or highlight or erase or whatever. Um, and you would then basically move, uh, for example, from the center out to one of the, the segments to select that item. Like to move an item, you would go um, 
uh, or to, to, to select the item submenu, you would go up vertically. And then uh, that's what the user did here in this case. And then he's by selecting the item menu here, he has now the option to zoom, move or highlight the item. And he zooms it by going back in to the center through that second quadrant. So if you don't know this interface, you can just do that slowly and go up and select this. And then the menu items will change. Uh, and we'll show the items of an individual menu bar, uh, uh, drop-down uh, list, and then you can pick the item that you want. But if you've done that a couple of times, you've learned that zooming an item in is basically this gesture that looks a little bit like drawing the letter P. And if you just tap and draw that letter immediately, I think there was a, men a button on the on the pen to switch to this uh, you know command mode in general. So you hold on the button and you press down and you do this, then the, item, the whole menu item wouldn't appear anymore. You wouldn't show the menu. It just basically takes that command gesture and executes the command. But if you ever forget to gesture, you could just press down with this little command button held down, wait for a fraction of a second, and the menu would be back, and you can revert to using it like a, like a normal pull-down menu. So the result is that you're fluidly and reversibly transitioning between expert and novice user um, to, to select these commands. And that's really nice. Um, because an explicit mode that is an expert mode uh, is a problem, right? Because maybe I don't know when I'm ready for the expert mode, um, and maybe I don't know when how to get back to the novice mode once I've turned it on. So uh, this is always a tricky business. Here's another example. Um, this is taken from the, the, the system preferences in macOS. Um, if you want to, you can go in and configure the shortcuts um, for all kinds of menu items. You can actually go in and create a keyboard shortcut for a menu item that didn't previously have one. Uh, simply by selecting that, you know, selecting that menu item and adding a keyboard shortcut here on the right side and, and checking it. Um, but notice that the interface itself here is graphical, right? It's not a textual configuration file, um, the way that it would be maybe in, in, in your typical command line unit, uh, Linux based uh, app. It's a nice graphical interface because while I am a, a professional user when I, in for example, Word, and I uh, want to configure Word to use a certain keyword shortcuts for stuff I do often that doesn't have a keyword shortcut, I'm not a perfect, I'm, I'm not a professional user of the keyboard shortcut dialog pane, right? I'm not changing keyboard shortcuts every day. <coughs> so this interface will always be only used infrequently, so it has to be very easy to use in itself. Here's the last rule uh, of the 10 golden rules. If you have to design icons, interface elements, if you have to pick color schemes, if you have to do visual design in your interface, please hire a graphic designer. Don't punish the world by having an engineer do the drawing uh, in the interface uh, if the engineer doesn't have uh, a graphical design skill. Um, remember this one, you know, where even with the color scheme, like I said, seems to be um, kind of limited. It seems like he only had new yellow, green, and red as, as colors here. And that color scheme suggests something to me. Um, it suggests this, right? It looks like a cheap supermarket brand. They use these colors, right? They're trying to communicate aggressive, attention-grabbing, cheap, come here, buy now. Um, but that's not the, probably not the effect that the uh, designer was going for when he, when he created this interface. Um, and I'm showing this uh, the screen here, because um, this is a nice example. This is an application for 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 um, uh, for note taking, a, a hierarchical uh, outliner um, uh, called Omni Outliner, and the icon for it and the full blown version looks like what you see here. It's it's a piece of art, right? This is this is this is an artwork, um, and as you zoom out, as as you make it small and smaller, because it may have to become an icon in the dock, for example it still has uh, that visual richness, right? With all these things here. But look at when you really have a tiny overview of lots of applications and you only need a tiny icon, the user, the, the designer didn't just scale it down with Photoshop further and further, he actually changed it. In the smallest version of this icon, the blue second piece of paper that's behind the orange first one is actually gone because a visual designer who had a had a human mind looked at this and said 
at that side at that size i can't communicate this idea of two overlaid pages anymore there's too few pixels to show this so he intentionally changed the icon to be simpler not just scaled down with photoshop so and those are things that you know you learn when you're a graphic designer but you don't learn this when you're a computer scientist unless you take the eyes one of course so those were the 10 rules um and uh we're we have a few minutes left so beyond those 10 golden rules i will go into a few details um that i kind of skipped over when we talked about uh rule number four but here just to to let the sink in here are the 10 rules to um to review keep it simple the most important one um speak the user's language right don't use terms but also concepts from the application domain of the user be consistent and predictable uh, so use the same language the same iconography the same command structures the same navigation techniques uh, along similar situations um, and don't surprise people right the principle of least surprise is something really important um, and then minimize memory load so make sure that you don't overload the user's short-term memory um, if you can avoid error situations, keep the user away from it by, for example, limiting the things that people can input to a text field. Um, help them to recover from errors if they make any and offer an undo functionality. Um, then uh, the slightly more um, obscure thing of closed dialogues, you know, make sure people understand when something is done so they can relax and start the next task and always give them a way to get out of a situation in a dialogue so that they can get back to a safe place that they understand um, as a starting point. For example, you know, the home button on iPhones uh, was a really uh, easy, safe place. It, what, whatever I was doing, if I pressed the home button, I was on the home screen. Uh, there's no longer a home button on iPhones. Sorry, you can't see this unless I do this. Um, there's no longer a home button on iPhones, which is actually in that respect, um, uh, a worse design usability wise. Um, Include help and documentation. Uh, we talked about different levels of documentation here. Address user needs from novices to experts and make sure that they can transition between these states uh, fluidly. And make sure to hire a graphic designer for the visual design layout work that needs to be done as part of your UI. Now, I skipped over this responsive part here a bit, and I'm going to uh, introduce you to a couple concepts here. Um, and I'm going to take that from a different uh, book uh, written by Jeff Johnson. Jeff Johnson is a really cool guy. He wrote a book called GUI Bloopers years ago. And GUI Bloopers was a book that was full of bad user interfaces. Very entertaining book. Uh, as a user interface you know, expert, you would go through that book and you would laugh at every user interface in there and think, oh, boy, what a bad design. Until, you know, on page 37, you discovered something where you're like, huh. I designed an interface that looked just like that. I, get, I guess I made one of those mistakes myself. So it's a great book. And you know, it was so successful, he had to write um, you know, a GUI bloopers 2.0 version, and he had to write a web bloopers. So he, he became like the bloopers guy, and he, he hated that. But it was, it was a really successful book. Anyway, um, from that book, I'm going to uh, take a, a bit of information that I really like that Jeff shared in there uh, that was about responsiveness. Um, what is responsiveness? Um, responsiveness is, means that a system reacts quickly to the user's actions. Uh, so it's clearly, in the Norman sense, the part of this gulf of evaluation, right? If you don't do that, then the gulf of evaluation opens up. But don't mistake responsiveness for technical speed of the CPU. It's not the same. Most problems in responsiveness can be solved just by smart, clever programming techniques. It doesn't always just require as, as far, fast a CPU. So examples are a screen pointer, a mouse pointer that doesn't keep up, right? That lags behind, terribly annoying, almost impossible to use. Or I press a button and, um, sorry, and only after like, you know, two ten tenths of a second, the button responds. We know from one of the earliest experiments I shared with you in this class, that we have 100 milliseconds of time before people start perceiving delayed cause and effect, right? 100 milliseconds is your window for reaction to these, you know, uh, discrete events. At least the first reaction, like inverting a button. Um, sliders and scroll bars that lag are terrible. If you scroll down a page, you know, using a slow phone or a, a slow connection, and you scroll and this thing keeps scrolling beyond where you want it to stop, it's, it's 
it's really unusable. unusable. Um, or if you have applications that when they save a file or to a to a remote server, they just go dead. You can't do anything while they do that, right? That's that's also annoying. Or you opened a big file, um, and it's like this 500 megabyte file that you're loading from a server, and you quickly decide, oh, that was the wrong file. I didn't want to open that. And then you have to sit there and wait for a minute until it's loaded just to say, uh, open another one, right? That's annoying. You want to be able to cancel these operations. Or um, this is something we don't see often these days, although with slow internet connections, you might still, uh, when screen repaints happen more than once, right? When a system keeps draw redrawing things, even though it only would have to redraw it once, uh, that's also very annoying. Um, and just as, a, as, as some examples, um, um, a guy from Amazon reported in, a, in, in, a, in an article that they did an experiment and they dropped their load time of the Amazon product page by, they made it 100 milliseconds slower, a tenth of a second, which we know is just at that border of noticeability, right, um, for people. That's where they just perceive a delay. And 100 milliseconds of extra load time actually reduced, caused a 1% drop in sales. And that's a lot for Amazon, right? Um, Google found, uh, Marissa Meyer reported that, who um, um, has been head of uh, user experience at Google, um, Google found that 500 milliseconds, so half a second of extra load time for their website uh, caused 20% fewer searches. That's significant, right? Similarly, um, uh, Nicole Sullivan from Yahoo uh, reported that 400 milliseconds of extra load time for their page caused about a five to 9% increase of people who just clicked back before the page even had st stopped loading. So, you know, um, five to 10% sort of, you know, say, ah, I don't care, and they go back. Now, where is this coming from? Um, first of all, the importance of uh, responsiveness isn't widely known. As a UI, you know, UI designers often think of other things first. They think of, you know, uh, Gestalt laws and they think of natural mappings and, on, and, and a good information architecture and so on. Then that also means that they rarely specify responsiveness because the designer just thinks, well, if I put a button there and the user clicks on it, of course it's going to react immediately. Like, why wouldn't it? So they often don't think about this dynamic aspect of their interface and how that is supposed to happen, especially down in the you know fraction of a second range. And performers, uh, sorry, programmers often make the mistake that uh, that we tend to make as as computer scientists uh, that we think it's just computer CPU performance and software performance, and it's not the same. I'll show you why. Uh, it's more you know. It's more the performance of the programmer and less the performance of the CPU, actually. Um, also, responsiveness is just difficult. It's difficult tuning. And then oftentimes people say, oh, we'll just start releasing it first and then we'll get, we'll fix that in the next release. And then it gets pushed back and gets pushed back because other things come up that need to be added, new features, et cetera, um, other bugs. And then it often gets, gets forgotten about because, you know, it works. It just takes it a little longer than it should. And people don't realize how impactful it can be, as I just showed you in these uh, examples from Amazon, Google, and Yahoo. Um, another problem is that developers often think of human input, uh, like people clicking on a mouse, just like input from a machine, like reading something from file. I mean, the Unix uh, operating system actually used the same principles for user input and for file input, right? Whether you read, whether an application read input from a, from a keyboard or from a file was the same to Unix, right? It shows that we traditionally system architectures and computer science haven't really reflected on human input very, very much in detail. And this is changing now that we have more and more complex input devices like depth cameras and gesture input systems and voice recognition and so on. But here's another one, and that doesn't go away. Programmers are lazy, right? So if we have to write code, we write the code that is the easiest to write, that is easiest to maintain maybe, that's the quickest to write and the shortest. And that is not usually the best implementation. Think about the progress bar. 
it's not that the people who wrote the progress bar were evil in themselves and that's why they make it stop at 99%. No, it's just that you know they used something like, oh, I don't know, I have 15 things to do to open this file. So after each command, I'm going to advance uh, the progress bar by, you know, 6% because 6 times 15, that's roughly 100. And then they didn't think about the fact that the last step they do is one that takes way longer than the steps that they had to do before. Um, and so that the last step in the progress bar actually doesn't advance as fast as the others. This requires you to literally test and, and stop the timing of your operation and then apply that progress to your progress bar, right, to understand well, how long does it take to open 100 small files? How long does it take to open one two, you know, two gigabyte file? You have to know these things to build a progress bar that works. Um, but it's not just lazy developers. It's also that the tools that we have available today are actually inadequate because um, the GUI tools that we use to build um, our uh, to, to build with development tools, we, we don't have good tools to design for responsiveness. I mean, we know about online limitations, like networks are slow, uh, everybody knows that, but it's kind of hard to, um, to actually put that in numbers. Let me give you an example. Um, let's say you, you have to implement a scroll bar in a new system, right? It's, it's maybe an embedded device, like a washing machine that has a scroll bar in its UI. You can't use you know, your standard Windows or Mac or Linux or whatever, and you have to build it yourself. Um, and you have to decide how does the callback work when you when you update the text uh, in, in your window, the contents. Um, does the scroll bar, the text in, in the window, scroll as you move the scroll bar, as you drag it, or only after you let go? Of course, after let, you let go is the bad solution because then I don't see the update until I let go, right? It's pretty useless. Um, but if the designer doesn't specify that, the developer will make a decision and that will use really technically simplest. And it's much, much simpler, I can tell you from implementation, just to wait for the end of the, 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 the gesture on the scroll bar, measure how far the scroll bar was dragged, then compute how far the text needs to be scrolled, and then jump to that view of the text. It's very easy, but it defeats the use of the scroll bar as an interactive scrolling device. It makes it into a glorified button. And, and developers are not usually trained in user interface theory and concepts like you are now beginning to get trained with DIS1. Uh, and that's perfectly normal, just as you know, UI designers are usually not trained in implementing large software products in C++, right? It's just a different skill set. Um, and that's in, in transitioning between design and development, these things often get lost because they are not being communicated. So let's share some eternal facts here. First of all, Responsiveness is not the same as performance um, because even with a slow CPU, even with a one megahertz CPU uh, today, you can build a responsive system if you write smart code. And don't assume that the problem goes away just because stuff gets faster. Because as you know, uh, you, you know, people had just gotten used to the fact that computers were really fast <coughs> when, damn it, there came smartphones which all of a sudden needed to watch their battery consumption and were actually comparably slow by com you know, compared to the desktops of the time. Um, and now we've got smart watches, right? And they have a tiny battery and a tiny CPU and they are even less uh, resource powerful. They're probably you know, slower than your computer that you had five years ago. Um, and so performance doesn't just always continues to go up with new technological trends. We need to understand that um, you know, we, we face these challenges again. And it's funny, if you think about it from a user perspective, even today, I look at our glasses as much as I did 15 years ago. So even though computers got, you know, hundreds of times faster in, the, in, that, uh, in that time frame, I don't see that, you know, my user interface all of a sudden has gotten faster. So it's, it's a different problem, right? It's a problem that UIs are actually real-time systems and real-time systems are really hard to program, as you know. Uh, with deadlines, hard deadlines built in that are based on the fundamentals of human condition, uh, of, of human cognition. Now, what people need to realize is that software doesn't need to do everything instantly. If I tell my computer to load um, a gigantic photo of the moon that is like, you know, 10 million pixels by 10 million pixels, 
it doesn't need to load the whole picture instantly. It's enough to maybe load a tiny fraction of it and start showing me that and load the rest of it in the background while I'm looking at the starting point of, of my, my photo viewer, right? It also doesn't need to do everything in a given order. If I ask it to, uh, I don't know, um, first uh, load 15 files and then delete 15 files, um, it can do these things in different orders um, based on you know what, what's most effective for the user interface. If I ask it to redraw the screen and to um, you know compute um, a database transformation, it can decide to first do the screen transform the screen rendering and then do the database transformation in the back. Sometimes it doesn't even need to do things at all. About that hum about the gigantic picture of the moon, if I load it and the user only ever looks at you know a tiny quadrant and never scrolls to the far areas of that picture, why should I ever load it? I don't need to, right? So sometimes I don't need to do things at all. And that's something a lot of software doesn't realize because developers tend to just go through and say, I'm going to do these things step by step. Now, there are three human deadlines that we should be aware of, and these are kind of important. So um, please take these with you, and that will be wrapping up things for today. Um, the three human deadlines are, first of all, the tenth of a second. You already know that one, right? From the CMN model, the 100 milliseconds that is the now in our human perception. So the delay between a mouse click and inverting a button or between moving the mouse to a new position and the pointer catching up, although that's actually even trickier with these continuous movements, you need to be sometimes even faster than hundreds of a second. But certainly for discrete actions, I would say, you know, that's where the hundred, uh, the tenth of a second, 100 milliseconds applies. So that's when you need to at least start reacting in your code. The second thing is one second. One second is a typical turn taking in conversation. So if I say something now and I end my sentence, and it's a question I'm addressing at somebody of, of you, after about one second, I would expect some reaction from you. If you don't react for a second, it's weird, right? So typically you don't need to give the answer, but you do like, mm, or you would like, shake your head or nod to say that you, you, that you know that you've been asked, right? Um, and that's typically the turn taking time in conversation. It's also the reaction time we have for unexpected events. You know, you're driving along the, the Autobahn and suddenly something falls from a bridge. You've got a one second, you know, Schreck Sekunde, as we say, this reaction time before we can do something. This means that as a software developer, you have after that tenth of a second where you need to react, for example, by inverting a button when the user presses an open file button, you have now one second from pressing that button to show something. It doesn't need to be the file that was that needs to be open because that can take longer, but it needs that to then at least be a, a progress bar or you know um, something that shows me that you are that you've started working on it, okay. Um, or for example, if you have an autosave after one second, uh, uh, it's okay if the system kind of you know gets gets slow for a second if it's auto saving, but if it takes any longer, then it should tell me that it is auto saving and, and inform me that's why I'm seeing you know a, a lag in my typing or something like that. And the third latency deadline is 10 seconds. 10 seconds is the typical human attention span. It's very sad, but um, if you uh, make somebody wait in front of a dialog box that says loading your file for more than 10 seconds, they will start checking their Facebook status or email or, or WhatsApp or whatever. So that means when people come back after, you know, when a task takes longer than 10 seconds, you need to expect that they will have moved their attention to somewhere else. And then when you're done, you need to alert them to the fact that you're actually done and need to make it sure that they can enter the inter in interaction smoothly again so that they get reminded of what they were doing. Um, also, if you can manage, it's great if you have, for example, you're designing um, uh, um, an assistant to help somebody um, do a, a banking transfer, like a bank transfer. Each step of this assistant should take no longer than 10 seconds so that they feel that they're moving through this within you know, their attention span. So finishing a given input for a task is sort of the, the maximum time. Uh, like you know, a print dialog pops up and it should be able to handle that print dialog in 10 seconds and then sending off the print job, otherwise it's too long. 
there are a whole bunch of design techniques for responsiveness. Um, you can meet the human time deadlines. That's the first goal, of course, by relying on the three deadlines that I just described and, and recognizing the differences between these. Um, and by acknowledging user input immediately, like for example, inverting that button that the user pressed, right? Uh, and then after a second, displaying a, a busy or progress indicator if you cannot complete the task by then. It's a good idea to do that as frequently as you can in your code, even if you have something like, um, you know, um, I don't know, uh, display that message. If you know that this message might actually at some point have to be displayed via a remote server connection that's slow, you may want to prepare yourself for handling that. I know that, for example, in the Mac Finder, when you open a window, it usually expects to be able to show the contents of that window immediately. Uh, but when you're opening a, a window from a remote server over a slow connection, that actually takes a long time and there is no good feedback that the system is working on that task because the finder was never designed for really slow network drives to be, be shown and, and interacted with. So it feels really sluggish in that range because it doesn't have these progress indicators in there. So for example, with the progress bar, we talked about make it real, right? Make it go linearly, um, make it show the total items remaining, the overall progress, not the progress of each single step that I'm doing. It's not useful for me as a user. Uh, and estimate the overall total time that's remaining. If you're installing software, I want to know when I can start using it, not when you're done installing the first 15 files, right? I don't care about that. It has to advance uh, linearly, don't hang at 99%, um, and the estimated time should always go down, never up. We already talked about this with the progress bars. Uh, and telling people less than a minute is better than 47 seconds is also clear. We also discussed that with the Windows dialog um, because, you know, a, I don't care about 47 exactly, and B, I know you're lying anyway. The other thing, thing that you can do with uh, responsiveness is to, to display important information first. So, for example, uh, when, the X, uh, when the X window system was designed, it was displaying things over a network, uh, and networks were really slow at the time. So the way that it was would draw a clock was actually surprisingly... Um, uh, surprisingly staggered. I don't know. Do we have an animation for this, uh, Oli? Or yeah, but unfortunately, in the end of the slide. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll I'll advance to the other topics then and show the animation. Then we should probably just intertwine that differently. So, for example, the X clock would first rent first show just the hour figure, actually, not even the minute figure. Then the minute figure would appear. It would render that, and that already even just seeing the hour figure uh, would tell you roughly how late it is. Then, if you see both of these, you can already tell. Okay, it's probably uh, quarter to one or something like that. Um, or it could be quarter to two at this point, not sure. Uh, and then it would render the uh, cardinal directions, the four directions, left, right, up, down. Then it would put the other num uh, lines in between. Um, and then it would fill in maybe these uh, these minute markers, right? Uh, because sometimes the connection was so slow that this would actually take several seconds. And if you wanted to just see the time, you could see it immediately by rendering the hour hand and the minute hand uh, first. So what that means is uh, you can work in parallel. So you can delay, delegate work that isn't time critical to a background process. Uh, you can work ahead by preparing requests that are likely to come next. And you can optimize your queuing so that you, you order things in a logical order, like with this clock, right? This is, I think, the, the example that, that uh, shows that nicely. Um, what I mean with uh, uh, working in parallel means that uh, you take things that don't need to happen right now and you delay them to later background processes. Um, here's an example of that. Um, this is the Word, um, uh, Word Perfect program, uh, a, a very early, um, oh, sorry, Word Star program uh, that was a very early uh, um, text editor before Microsoft Word came out. It ran on a really slow computer. Um, and uh, it was it was accommodating for that by make it, because it was very responsiveness responsive. You never lost a character when you typed in WordStar. And I know sometimes even today when I run on like a you know two gigahertz computer, I sometimes type something and the computer doesn't catch my key presses, which is ridiculous. It shouldn't happen, right? And WordStar never dropped characters because if it got tight in resources, it would always capture the keyboard buffer and it would always display these characters on screen instantly. And instead, it stopped updating, for example, you know, the bottom or the top of the screen if it was too slow to do that in the, in the time available. 
So it was decreasing quality uh, or quantity in this case um, you know, to keep up and adjusting the strategy if it was too slow. Um, if you take the Opera file browser, for example, when you download a file, it asks you where you want to save it while it is downloading the file, which is super smart. Why should it wait for the download to complete and then ask you where to save it? It can save it in a temporary directory uh, while it is downloading. And meanwhile, you can fill out the question of where it should save it. And guess what? You, you pick the right folder where you want to save it. You hit save it here. That maybe took you five seconds and boom, it's already downloaded. And you're like, oh, wow, that was fast. In reality, it was just downloading all the time while you were busy picking the right location where to put the final version of the file. That's great design, right? That's smarts of, of, the, the, of the developer. Um, and I think we're, are we done with this? Yeah, this is the last, this is the last slide. Uh, you need to test under different conditions, right? Um, under heavy loads, on slower network connections, on slower systems that your customers might have. Developers are often, um, you know, really uh, treated well with fast computers because it's a good investment to buy developers fast computers if they code because they're expensive. Every hour of a developer is really expensive, but they then get used to these fast computers and they don't remember that their users might actually have much smaller, uh, slower machines. Um, uh, you know, until until not so long ago, Amazon actually tested their website even on on old browsers using a 56k modem, right? Just to give you an idea of how slow things can can be tested. Uh, you know, today you would probably say you want to test your your uh, site or what you're designing, even if somebody only has an edge connection um, on their on their computer. All right, with that, I'll wrap up for today. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, Next week, we will uh, you know, wrap up this. There's a few more things to say about performance, um, and then we will move into notations. Thanks, everybody, and have a great rest of the week. This content was provided by RWTH, Aachen University.